Okay, so let's start up Max. And what we're going to see now is polygonal tools and more advanced functions of modeling uh, using other tools in the hope that all the fundamentals are well understood now. Here we're going to go a little bit faster. We're going to use keyboard shortcuts and we're not going to explain them every single time. Rotation, scaling and so on. By default, 3D Studio Max has its own colors and I'm going to ch I've changed that now to make it a little bit more comfortable for video use and for this training. So we can go custom UI and default switcher. This is a new thing to 210 and it allows me to have a look at the different looks for 3D Studio Max. So let's set this one and now this tells me that it will become uh, automatically the default when I start Max again. Okay, right. What I'll do now is make a box in the perspective view. I'll show segments with F4. I'll add some segments. Let me convert this box into an editable poly. Right, let's make it bigger. Alt W for full screen. Right, take some faces. I'll tick ignore back facing. So I'll go around control and select the two faces. Right mouse button, scale, there we go, right mouse button, extrude, scale again, scale again, move, okay, so uh, scale, and so on. So let's move that back. All the time we're doing the same thing, always moving, always using extrude. So scale, move, and a new thing to 210 as well. Let me select these two sides with the control. And now I can insert a face into the middle of another one. So inset, there we go, and scale. And now I'll extrude it. And let's move the ends down a bit. Lift them up. Okay. And scale again. And it's always the same thing. Exactly the same. Scale. Extrude. Scale. There we go. Let's use inset again here to make intakes. And extrude. And this time we're going to extrude inwards. Obviously extrusions can be done in both directions, so inwards as well as outwards. Choose inset. And now we'll move that. There we go. Very good. Okay, I've modelled my flyer enough. And now I'm going to go into vertex mode. Alright, now you can choose... You should also know that you can choose the sub-objects by using 1 to 6. So one, two, three, four, five, and six for coming out of sub-object mode. So let's go back in. One, two, three, four, five, and six for coming out of sub-object mode. This corresponds to this. One for points, two for segments, three for open edges, five for polygons. I mean, oh no, hang on, four for polygons, obviously, and five for elements. Six is to quit sub-object mode and to come back to object root top level. Okay, there we go. You can also get to them here, right mouse button, on the quad menu. So, I'll go to vertex mode, I'll select multiple vertices with the control key, and move them back we go. Now do the same here. One, two, three, four vertices and move them again. Right. Now we'll see two or three other little things uh, so that we can work in polygonal mode and this is a first little reminder and we're going to work on this object to see other things. Okay, I hope you remember that the last time in the fundamentals uh, we used Turbo Smooth. Well, I won't have to here. So if we go down here, 
it's subdivision surfaces. So there's so many things in here. So let's just do right mouse button, close all. And then we just see in here subdivision surface. Use NERMS is for making a subdivision that's non uniform. And like this, we have a, a one, a two, a three iterations. So it's just exactly the same principle as Turbo Smooth. You can ask for a you can ask for one iteration in the viewport and three at the render time. So if I leave it on one here, I now do Shift Q, and you can see that subdivision is a lot stronger on the render than it is in the viewport. Okay, let's turn this off. Put it up to two. What I'll do now is go in selection and I'll choose vertex. Subdivision is automatically done inside the editable poly. I don't have to add a modifier or anything. If I take these two points and I move them, I can see you can see that I'm moving the points as though they are hooked into the polygon. So how does this work? So this always works on the rule of three. So there's one, two, and three. So now I've got a curve. The tension between them is adjustable, as I'll show you later. Okay, one, two, three. And the same again, one, two, three, around here, towards the third point. And so on and so forth. This is why the minimum number of points to create these lines of force is very interesting to making a nice smoothly curved shape. So it's always going to try and go between the first, second and third point. So that's how you get pretty good smoothing. Okay, now the tension, as I explained earlier, is down here. If we go down to Edit Vertex, Edit Vertices, and we can see the weight there. So we can change the tension on which it's going to pull on those points and the subdivision surface underneath. When I move to edge mode, segments, I can see that edit edges and there's weight and crease. This other thing is very interesting. What it allows me to do, if I take these four segments that make the nose of the ship, I can change the shape of using the weight, but I can change the hardness. If I put the hardness to maximum, then I can see, oh, I didn't get that one. Okay, there we go. Now, it allows me to have a part of my spaceship that's harder than the others. So, like that, we'll do the edges of the wings. Uh, in the background, they're not selected. We can see a variation in color. That's because we've turned off ignore back face, or we've turned on ignore back facing. So we'll select the two, and then the ones at the back on the other side, and let's change the crease to one. And there we go. So I'll do the same for the ends of the tail plane. There we go. Now at render time we have hard creases and smoothed out areas at uh, different places on the object. So, there we go. The principle of subdivision. However, if the subdivision bothers you a bit, you can always just turn it off by going into subdivision surface and unticking use NERM subdivision. When you turn off subdivision, you go back to your normal polygonal mesh. If you add a modifier uh, subdivision surfaces like Turbo Smooth, it will keep the settings that you gave um, the NERM subdivision surfaces and so you've got soft and hard areas. The Turbo Smooth can be put over the top of the editable poly so you can see subdivision in real time or you can turn it off. You can either leave it on the editable poly or you can put the Oboe Smooth over the top. So it keeps the settings you made in NERMS. Let's go on to the ease of selection in the editable poly. For understanding selection in editable poly mode, we'll start with a teapot. There we go. And I'll convert it to poly. Edit, convert to editable poly. 
let me take off the grid and now I go to selection I can see points segments open edges faces and elements what's very interesting with the teapot is that the teapot contains all these elements let me hit F4 so you can see the wireframe so the points so I can see the points there if I can go into segments I can see segments and borders and for borders you ought to know that my editable poly object teapot is not very well closed it's got quite a few elements here which I'll move that aren't that are open completely so borders are there so here as well we can see that the form is open it's a, a primitive form that is one of the very first complex objects modeled in 3D just as a reminder and not history but it's also got a lot of interest uh, for teaching purposes so because it's got a lot of different subject objects included in its topology so selection modes so let's select points vertex if I select that one I can shrink or grow my selection grow to expand shrink to reduce reduce if I think that vertices aren't very clear it's a bit small on display you can go into customize preferences viewports and you can change the size of the dots so seven uh, uh, you can really see them customize preferences viewports and let's just put them back to three okay okay so I'll repeat so I can select this point I can grow my selection or I can shrink it there's two types of selection you can also see them for segments and for pretty much all of the things but when you press segments you also have ring and loop when you select a segment you, the segment has got an orientation so you can say without a problem I either continue in that orientation or I can go in a ring around my object in the other direction and in the case of points uh, you can't really say which direction it's going that's why it doesn't have ring and loop okay that's impossible that it could have those two things okay let's do ring and I can see that I have a ring around my object if I choose loop then I go in a direction around my object if I redo ring now it takes all of them which could be interesting if I do a scale don't forget scale in the middle of the section should be done for this exercise and there we go uh, let's try the other ones let's try ring loop and scale and then we can see that it scales all if I want the points that correspond to these edges i.e. these ones the ones that are selected as edges at the moment it's not very difficult all I have to do is hold down control and click on the points icon there we go now we'll go on to another little amusing exercise let's choose the segments again we'll take one out of every two there we go and then we'll do a loop and now we'll do scale and now I'll take control I'll convert them to vertices and as scale again then you can still do that for polygons now we'll add other things so we can select this face or I can say by angle all the faces that are at 45 degrees or less so you can list that up or list it, move it down in number of degrees 
Water degrees correspond to, not to temperature obviously, but the angle of orientation. So in regard to the first selected, everyone that's got an angle that's determined here will be selected. So sometimes it's a bit difficult to go in through all the different things all the time. Points, segments, borders, faces or elements. You have another way of doing it. Preview selection, sub-object or multi. Multi is very interesting because depending on what you select, let's put in move mode and you can see which ones you're going to have. So in bright yellow. So if I go on an edge, on a, a segment there, so instead of choosing what mode you want to be in, the fact that you've ticked multi allows me that I can actually take a face, and it's still subject to by angle, a vertex, or a segment. So that option's really good. So you can find all the selection tools in selection. The soft selection tool in the editable poly is also very cool. It's comparable to soft selection in, in all the rest of 3D Studio Max with some extra bits. These extra bits, we haven't actually seen them in the fundamentals section, so let's make a plane. And we'll subdivide it a lot. 50 by 50, I think. Yep, there we go. Right, now I'm going to convert this into editable poly. Okay, Alt W, and let's go to point mode. Let's choose a point, and I'm going to choose open soft selection. I'm going to turn it on. Okay, so if I enlarge the fall off, so I can see that the soft selection gets bigger. Fall off just means the attenuation from the area you selected. As the colors get colder, it corresponds to the influence. So strongly influenced is the red areas going out down through the sides so we get cooler colors and then the curve just softens completely off okay if you move this point w on the keyboard pulling it up corresponds to the little curve in that window over here control z and now if you modify the pinch now you can see that the drawing has changed completely and so have the colors on the plane at this point now I've got a pinch that we can see in this drawn curve let me put it back to zero and bubble is the same but in the other direction so that it makes a more rounded selection in more like a dome shape I'm going to keep this one for a further example Okay, you've seen something particular here. I'll pull it up and let go. Now, automatically, the selection adapts. So I'll continue to pull up and you can see the automatic selection has adapted again. Why is it adapted like this? Well, it's very simple. If we look at the fall off, it's always the same. So 60 of 4.8 here. And so around this point there's a fall off that's got a certain radius so a circle around the point you've chosen when the point was down at the bottom then the circle would be around the base of the object and as I pull it up then the circle is there control Z watch carefully Let's lock soft selection this time. If I use this, now the fall off won't adapt to where I'm going and it's completely blocked to those original points that I've selected. So it stays in, in memory, if you like. If you turn off lock selection, now it will readapt. If I use another type of sub-object, like mm, a polygon, let's say, a face, we'll take a face there, I'm in soft selection, but we don't see it. To see it in polygon mode, or in other things, so we should tick shaded face toggle. And now we can really see our soft selection. 
Control Z. Let's come back to the vertex mode. And you can paint a selection if you want. You go paint here, and then you can paint the selection that you make, and you can blur it so you can blur it out, soften the area you've selected, and move. Well, let's just do paint now. Let's paint my selection here. Okay, I can change the value of my selections. I can change my brush size. And I can change it change its strength. Okay. So again, blurring. So I just blur over this corner so that we've got a slight variation in the colors that are going as I go. So always the same. Now force of the blur which will give it a more smooth attenuation okay let's move and there's my soft selection let's hit six so we'd come out of sub-object mode we'll have a look at brush options next the brush options in Editable Poly are pretty much the same brush options as there are everywhere else in 3D Studio Max. Okay, so I'll make a sphere, which I'll add a few more segments. So let's put 60. And now I'll convert it into Poly. And there we go. I'll go back into Vertex. And now I'll activate Soft Selection. I'll put it in paint, brush options. And now you can see a little menu, a little graph. It looks a bit bizarre to start with, but it's not at all. Display options, so I can choose what I want to have drawn. I don't want to see anything. I do that. I can draw a ring, so it's the circle around my paintbrush, if you like. The normal is the little blue sticky out thing. And it's very handy because it will also show you the uh, the power and the influence that you have. So you can change your normal scale so you can actually see it better. Trace allows you to see the traces that you're trying to draw. So you can see just down here this line. Okay. Right. Afterwards, you can change the influence. You can change the, the brush from strong to not so strong, linear, you can change presets, or you can make it yourself using all the traditional tools that we've done before. What's also interesting is that you can work with a graphics tablet, so you can change the strength through that, or work in mirror form. Let's do paint, and we'll do mirror in X, and what does that mean? So that means that all my actions are mirrored across the other side of the X axis. So you could change to Y, and then they're on the Y axis, or even Z, and then they're from top to bottom. Let's leave it on X. I'll take off Trace, and I'll leave the mirror option active, and I'll close that window. So take off the paint. Let me take off use soft selection. Okay. Now I'll go back into use soft selection and I'll go back into paint. I'm in mirror mode still. I'm going to see it straight away. What's very difficult is to change the size all the time by going through the menus. All you have to do is a mirror and as you can see shift control allows me to change the radius of my brush. And you can see that it's also kept all the old selections in memory. So let's revert. There we go. Okay, and now I'll come back to paint. Shift control changes the size, and I paint. Okay. Uh, with control, I can take away my selection.
that I just painted. So I continue to paint. Uh, with Alt Shift, I can change the force of my paint, as you can see. The normal is moving up and down. If I want to do W now, or maybe scale better, then that's what happens. Okay, don't forget, obviously, ignore back facing would be really useful here. Uh, there we go, there's a little bit of what you can do to do this kind of thing. I'm not really sure that it's very useful. Let's control Z to remove all this. But here we've got soft selection. I'll turn it off. And down here you've got paint deformer. So this is going to be almost exactly the same as before but we don't have to do scale or move. So with the same brush options, mirror or no mirror, let's take off mirror. Okay, now we've got push. There we go. And change the, the force that I've done. Shift, uh, Alt, and I can see my normal has changed length. And that's changing the force that I push with. Control Alt changes the size of my brush, and there we go. If I press Alt, now I'm pushing instead of pulling on my polygonal object. Relax just smooths out my dents. Revert is to go back to the original sphere. Okay, this is not a modeling tool in its own right, but it allows you to make other things a little bit more natural. Uh, a piece of paper that's deformed, uh, a saucepan that's a bit dented, a bit of detail on other objects. Okay, so we know that editable polys have lots of different types of sub-objects. We know them now. Points, vertex, edge or segment, uh, borders or open edges, faces with several sides, polygons, polys, and elements, which are objects inside top, the top level that don't have any uh, points in common. So we'll have a look at this a bit closer, and above all, how we can use the polygon functions. This box I'm going to subdivide 5 by 5 by 5. There we go, very good. Hit F4, and now we can see the segments. Okay, I'll convert to poly. Okay, now I have a look and I can see soft selections, edges, geometry, subdivision surface, subdivision displacement, and paint deformation. Uh, we've seen paint, we've seen soft selection. Uh, we've also seen the, the various modes of selection. And edit geometry is always there. Subdivision surface is always there. And it's the management of NERMs different, and the different options that they entail. Uh, management by NERMs is not to be confused with NERBS. Non-uniform mesh smooth is for a non-uniform subdivision of a, a mesh. Nothing to do with NERBS, which are worked by a cage. Uh, and we saw that back in Fundamentals. Subdivision displacement is a process of uh, division of your geometry uh, using a displacement map. Okay, the most interesting at the moment is edit geometry. And there's a big gap here. The gap comes from the different kinds of subjects you can select. Vertex, so you can see edit vertices. Segment, edge, you can edit edges, border, you can edit borders, polygon, you can see several different things, and so does element have several different things. So if I come back to vertex, edit vertices has lots of different menus. So if I take a vertex, a point, a delete with the keyboard, I make a hole. Well, just completely normal. Uh, if you delete that point, you're going to delete everything that depends on that point. So all the edges that attach to that point are all going to go. So you'll get a hole. So if you do remove instead, the point is taken away. But how's that worked? So 
you've got to know that polygonal objects in Max are still made of triangles that are at the moment invisible. When I removed the middle point of that polygon, that's that's a big worry. How did it do the triangulation? I don't know at the moment. Did it do this and triangular there and, and put another triangle this way? And is it as anarchic as me? Did it do this? I'm now really worried. I don't know how it does it. It's not a problem. We can see it. We go right mouse button down to object properties and we want display properties edges only untick it okay and now we can see our triangles and it's much nicer than I was there are the two triangles and these are the ones that were hidden and so these are typical to a polygonal object so an object that is polygonal will give you the ob the bits that you want to see and allow you to create faces with several sides faces with lots of sides which is called a polygon and that's why it's called a poly and that's why this face is a polygon right mouse button object properties let's put edge only back on okay however if you go into edges you can still see them by clicking on edit triangulation so if you want to you can actually turn the triangles around like so to redesign how you want your polygon to be subdivided always triangles let's go back to points when you quit you won't see the edges anymore because you're in polygonal mode even when you quit the sub-object. If you want to see the points all the time, you can always do that. You go into Object Properties and tick on Vertex Ticks. And now you will always see the vertices, whatever sub-object you're in, or even if you're at top level, you will still see the points. Object Properties, Display Properties, Untick Vertex Ticks. Let's go back. OK, we'll go back to Edit Vertices. Light lines, you can take a point and make a break. And at this point, you've made a hole in your form, in your shape. Okay. Right now, you can weld. And it's pretty simple. So the two points have to be at the same place. And then you can weld them together. Uh, you can click on this little settings button and you can have a weld threshold a zone in which uh, the points will be welded if you do apply it will keep the window open now you could carry on modeling and select the two points if the distance is correct then you'll see that you can weld the two together, you can apply, or you can hit OK, and the window will disappear. The weld is done. You also have target weld, where you take the first point, you hold down, and you go towards the target point, and you let go. Now, all those points are welded together. We can also do something else that's interesting. We can extrude a point. If we go on a point, we can go to extrude and we can choose its settings. So to give a height to a point and also to make its base enlarged. There you go, cancel. If you just use extrude on its own, and you, when you click, you can pull up to pull up the vertex and then when you move sideways with the mouse you change the size of the base you can like this continue to extrude more and more points chamfering is different so let's quit extrude let's click on chamfer and let's take this point 
I'll go into his visual options and I can just change the amount of point, uh, chamfer here, so spread the points apart. I can open that hole or I can leave it closed. OK, or apply. If we take several points, like these ones for instance, and do chamfer, then you can see what you get. Depending on the orientation of the points, this is what you get. If you do an error, if you, for example, take this point, uh, move it with the shift held down, and you've just leave it as an element point, this point is a bit lost and it doesn't have any reason to be except to mess up your geometry. Remove isolated vertices. Click. It's gone. OK. In Edit Vertices, I left out Connect. Maybe I forgot it. Uh, not really. I just left it until now because it's got a few more things that I need to show you. So, Connect is too, very simple. Take two points with Control and I hit Connect. Bingo. They're connected which is pretty good because now I can do a selection around the mountain here there we go and now do connect and now we can see that the connections are made and now we've got a, a very obvious segment for the mountain so this one and this one I'll do a connect as well and I could click as many times as I like it won't do it this is the limit of connect why does it refuse? It's very simple because there's no point in the middle on that line. So it won't it refuses to then go over the top of one line. Connections uh are well named because they go from point to point. If there's no point, there's no point. It's not a problem. We've got a much better connect if we go into edge mode. Here we go. Now, Edit Edge is much better for Connect. So let's take that one and that one. And I'll go into the Connect options, Connect Settings. I can connect with one segment or two segments or three. I can change the pinch from one side or the slide up and down the sides of the edges I chose. Uh, instead, I could actually choose different uh, edges so before I hit OK and then like this I can very quickly uh, three to one segments two segments yeah just change their uh, pinch and the, the, the amount of slide the the distance from which they were originally set so I won't do that one uh, I'll go down here so this is the the interesting thing about connect and particularly Edge Connect, and what you can do with it. And what you can do with the settings window open. If you do OK, then the, um, those connections are made and the settings window disappears. Like this, we've got different things, like remove, so we can allow us to remove edges that we've made. Uh, so I'll do a remove this one and select several with control to clean up. And now I could move up to face mode and extrude. Okay. Well, this is very pretty, but is it going to work? with subdivision. And now this is where you've got to be really careful. You can't just do anything you like. If I use a subdivision, I just go down here to subdivision surface with NERMS and I'm going to get some shapes that are really not very nice. It's because you can't just do subdivision any old how you still need to make sure that your model is correctly made and that you have perhaps the same number of points or 
uh, better connections. And above all, you've got to remember the principle of the three points. So what we're going to do is go back to segment mode, go back to edges, and we'll take this edge here, and this one, and we'll do a remove. And now we'll go back to subdivision. And as you can see, it's really awkward to get bang down to subdivision. And now we can right mouse button and we can click on NURBS or, NURBS or not. So the well-known modeling rules that uh, you should avoid triangles or other things, don't worry about it. We'll have a look at it later on in the, in the next few lessons when we're looking more at head modeling or other more complex objects. The, the goal here is to say you can't just do it what you like and also to explain how to use the edit edge tools. We can see that connect is more interesting in various different sub objects. Obviously it's a choice. Let's have a look at other choices in the edit edges. Okay, edit edges now. It's, we'll just use a box, it's, that's all we need to learn this thing. And we'll convert it to editable poly. And we'll go to edge mode. We'll edit edges and we can see we're F4 to go to the segments and we'll take these edges at the top here. Okay, good. Now I've got extrude. I'll pop up the settings and I can extrude the edges as you can see towards the outside or the inside and I can actually choose a, a spacing for my extrusion. So like this we can just add an extra edge to our box. Edges are still selected, so now let's go into chamfer, and now I can s uh, cut off the top of that edge, like this, so that I can make a, a square border, and I could actually have a rounding off by turning up the number of segments. If I do open, then it makes a hole. There we go. Okay. Weld it's for welding, it's exactly the same as the point version. Remove is always the same as well for just bridge and connect uh, much more interesting. Bridge allows you to connect uh, one edge to another where there's a hole. So we don't really see the point here, but let's make a teapot. Okay. Sitting on top of our nice box. Convert it to polys. There we go. Alright, and let's choose the element that's here and move it a little bit more away from the body of the teapot. There we go. Now take the the main part of the teapot and I'll delete these four polygons with delete on the keyboard. Right now if I pick those edges I could use if I use loop there we go. And now I'll do the same over here. Loop here it was ring that I should have used. Sometimes it's not very easy. It depends on how the object was made and the orientation of the edges. Okay, so now I've got the surrounding areas. Now if I go to bridge, now I can automatically create a bridge between those two sets of um, edges that I've chose. Uh, smoothing. Uh, you can reverse triangulation but we won't see anything there. I can specify bridge specifications so I can pick an edge here and pick the second one there. 
and like that I do it manually build the bridge as I need and we can continue like that specifying different edges so there you go and uh, and these numbers here are just the edge number uh, from the object so that's pretty good if we want to personalize our bridge however we could say it's pretty laborious this control said that okay instead of selecting openings with take with edges then we should just use borders which will allow me to just select the whole edge open edge and again control and click there and I've got the same thing there but I've got I've got bridge and now I've got the same principles uh, with I can do a, a blowing up or a, a bias to make the the blow up more towards one end or the other and a smoothing for the mesh and I can also twist in case you chose the wrong edges okay cancel uh, the difference between that and connect is that connect you've actually got to pick the segments that you want to connect so bridge is more interesting to, for us so I'll just pick these open edges there and there and there we go. Oh, hit OK. OK. Ah, the spout isn't very well placed. Uh, Control Z. And what I'll do now is I'll give those edges a name. Virtue. Openings. Hit OK. Hit Return. I'll select an element here. I'll give it a name. Beck. Spout in French. OK. Now if I come back to the list, I won't see anything. If I put myself on borders, then I can see Overture, which is um, the openings of my spout. Put it in face mode, and all I'll see is the spout polygons I named. If I go into pet elements, I'll see them as well. Okay, this is pretty good, because now if I come back to open edges, borders, if I click on bridge, there we go, get back that. If I come back on face, I'll take the uh, spout and I'll move it up. Uh, the bridge wasn't very well made, so let's move the the spout up, choose the borders, bridge, and there we go. That's better. Now let's move on to a practical exercise with the few things that we've looked at already, okay? Okay, we'll just do an exercise now that will allow us to use some of the things that we've already seen in Edit Edge and Edit Orders. Okay, now I'll make a sphere. Uh, hit F4 so I can see the wireframes. So I'll cut down the number of segments. Let me blow it up to full screen, convert it to poly, and there we go. Now, what I'm going to do is select the one, the polygons at the top. Let's see, uh, there's just too many. Let's work in surrounding mode. There we go, so now all I'm doing is selecting those polygons. Hit W and let's shift up so we can make a clone to element. Okay, let's change the scale. And put it down a bit. Okay. Right. Now let me select all the ones underneath, shift, OK, clone to element, and now I'll change the scale again. Flatten it out, OK. Let me delete the polys that are here, and I'm going to delete all these polys as well. Let's go back into point mode, select this point, and hit delete. OK, I'll choose the order and I'll change its scale and now I'll take this element and I'll shrink it down as well I'll move it up okay to start off with it was a sphere and I made several different holes uh, I can also change the scale of this one as well let's just shrink it down and bring it back closer okay and now it's becoming a pepper mill so if I take these two 
edges that are pointing to each other and then I'll go into bridge and I'll add a couple of segments uh, I'll change the, the taper here and I can have a look at the bias for moving the, the taper one way or the other uh, that's very good okay and hit apply let me take this border and this border and it's still going to keep the same connections the main properties and now you can change the design of your your pepper mill uh, um, salt shaker perhaps uh, let's change the bias a little bit before it was just a simple sphere remember okay see S you can do this pretty quickly for work like this to use poly objects and bridge okay so the bridge tool uh, whether it's for edges or for borders it works in in the two ways so when I say two ways it's just another way of seeing things so proof let me make a sphere I'll take the number of segments down and I'll make it a poly okay so let me take the top there in soft selection mode and change the fall off so that I can see the ones I'm going to move W to move those ones down so I make a kind of bowl okay so I'll go back to being in polygon mode now and uh, F4 to see the polygons I'll select, I'll turn off soft selection and now select every other polygon on this ring by holding down control okay I just hit delete and now I'll take the back facing ones on the other side that correspond to these ones so let me just select them all, it's pretty easy okay I'll hit delete again alright now what I'll do is go into borders and I'll hit control A to select all the borders now all I need to do is to go into bridge so let's go to settings and automatically all my zones are closed in so I've now got bridges between the inside and the outside let's change the segments and let me have a look at subdivision surface use NERMS let's change it to iterations and we can see what it does okay that's pretty good and maybe another segment oh, taper is not really going to help unless we want to uh, make the holes bigger or smaller okay really good and there you go that's what I call uh, segments that can be made and welded from the exterior to the interior or vice versa uh, bridge works just this easily it works on two open edges okay for this exercise you really need to know your fundamentals I'm not going to repeat them here because after all we've just done a nine hour DVD on them so you can always go back to see it okay so now in here I'll make a line in the front view just straight segments okay Let's modify the spline and just use the outline function zip okay now we don't need any interior segments for what I want to do but I might need some outside so you'll understand what I'm going to do we'll go back to vertex mode refine and I'll just add a couple of extra points on the outside line so okay so I'll go back to top level and I'll use lathe minimum and let's go into perspective view or W Z to zoom and I'll change I'll remove some of the segments six there we go that would do okay if you can see lots of segments up here that means that the vertex at the, at the top there was in busier mode 
and not linear. So let's go right mouse button, corner, corner, there we go, and they're, they're all gone now. And now it's all flat. Uh, if they just had a bit of tension there, they would be subdivided further. Okay, this is a good form. Let's convert to editable poly. Right. Okay, let's go on the left view. I'm going to make a line, a very basic line again. Just linear. There we go. Now I'll go into perspective view. I'll move that across. Now I'll select that poly here. Uh, right mouse button, extrude along spline. Options, pick spline. There we go. Okay, too many segments. So let's reduce that down. Three, that's good. Uh, could put a bit of taper if we like, but nothing more. Okay. All right. Now I'll take this poly here and the one behind, and that's good. So right mouse button, inset. Zoop and delete. Now I've got two holes, so if I go borders, control A to select them, and now I'll connect them with bridge. Uh, extra segment there, and there we go. Okay. Now I'll go into subdivision, so subdivision surface, use NERMS, and I'll use two iterations. And there's our subdivision. If I go back into vertex mode, then that will allow me to, to refine some areas with scale, like here. Let me shrink that in a bit. Cool. OK. What would be interesting to do now is to use hardness uh, um, to make certain areas more solid so, so we can see that we've got a, a kind of special cup that's just come out of a, a mold and so you've got the, the slight seams that you can see uh, where the two halves of the mold connect so what I'll do here is I'll take an edge so take these vertices uh, these edges here um, and now use a, a loop to select them all up and down. So edit edge, uh, I can see crease and I can give a little bit of hardness at that that point as though that was the, the bit where the, the seam was in. So let's hit 6 to get out of sub-object mode and there you go, you, you can see a little bit of a uh, a seam. Let me take that off and I could also choose connect by going to edge mode and then choose ring okay and use connect and it makes a new edge down the middle there uh, so the rule of three not being exactly correct now because now the smoothing isn't there anymore so subdivision works on a rule of three so I've got a rounding off here, but now here I've got one, two, three in a straight line. Um, so it's we've got the line there and the line there, and then it's a bit s straight there. Oh, it doesn't matter here. Well, let's move it out a bit to see what it gives. Yeah, well, let's undo that. Well, but I'll still keep it. Okay. And let's move it out. So here, I'll move it out because I'd rather like to have a, a kind of a, a jug type of effect. So, and having my seam here would be, make sense completely. Okay, to get a spout, it's not very complicated either. All we need to do is select the vertices here and we just move them around a bit. There we go. Oh, now be careful. If you go down too far, then you'll see the inside of the faces. So 
make sure you take all of the points so that you can move it all down together. There we go. And move that up a little bit. Okay, and you can keep working like this and keep going, keep going, so that you can adjust your spout as you like. Watch out for points that are on the inside. What I can do as well here is hit F3 to see wireframe, and I can really see how my, my object is working. So I can see that there's a little bit of uh, a, a squishing of the gap there. Um, but we can see it very easily if we understand our object. Here is our exterior profile. And I can see the control of the points going towards the inside. So those are the points. So if I move that one, I know that I'll change the, the thickness of the spout. There we go. So simple. And now you can manage the, the thickness at different uh, areas. You can add some thickness. Okay. If we wanted to have uh, a little bit more of a refinement here, then we we'll take this segment here, uh, not loop, uh, this segment, and we'll do bring. And now I can do a connect again. Uh, I'm not going to do very much here. I just want one line. So I can just move it up and down. Okay. And that allows me to change the scale and give a rounding or a little dent in there on all the form, on the top of my object. Okay. There we go. Uh, a little rapid kind of uh, jug exercise that will show us that we can do lots of different things. Okay, so let's go back to two or three little things uh, we haven't seen, and f for a good reason, because sometimes I combine them with other things. So now we're going to have a look at Sphere, and let's reduce its number of segments down to a very few. Oh, that's fine. Uh, convert it to polys, and Alt-W full screen. F4 to see the segments. I'm going to select edges and we're going to that one there and that one there and that one there. Okay, and now I'm going to go into split. Split is separate. So it's the same thing as break for points. So now what I can do is just move the edges up and there we go. Smile. Okay, now I'm going to border mode, select it, and cap it, and now I'm going to polygon face, and now I can select that face that I've just created. Always the same, now extrude once, twice, three times, and now a bit of a scale. Okay. Right, why did I show you split now? because it's so that you don't confuse it with uh, Edit Geometry's own split, which is down here. This is a little separate zone. Let's have a better look. Edit Edges and Edit Geometry. So let's close the others. They don't really help. Okay, so here I can see Split and also down here, split. But this is a bit different because this is in its own little zone inside edit geometry. This submenu allows you to tick the, mode, uh, the split mode to cut or do a quick slice or using a plane to slice. So before traumatizing our little basic example, I'll just use hold to save it. And now I'll go into edit geometry. So if I go into slice plane here, 
Now this allows us to take a plane that we make an edge on and we can actually see the red line that's going to appear where we cut. If we do slice then that's as you move the segment uh, as you move the plane it, it slices. When you you split then the segment is created but now your object has been cut. Quit the size plane and then if I go back to element and then you can see that I've now got two separate elements. Vertices are not in are not together anymore. Okay. So I can scale that. Border, to select all the borders. And where's the little bridge? Couple of segments and taper in. There we go, okay. Right, now let's come back to edit geometry. I'm in this still in the slice plane bit. With split and turn off split now, if I've got the slice plane I can move up and down as I like and then and modify it as well in rotation mode uh, or moving it scale doesn't actually do anything because the plane is infinite basically so if I do reset plane then it, the plane is back to its starting point if I turn off slice plane now quick slice allows you to just click on your object and then validate and you make your your slice but it's not very easy to control cut is a bit easier you just determine where the cuts are going to be with each click you make but be careful it's very important to be carefully positioned on the points so for this I would advise you to use um, snapping so use the snap toggles that you want to turn off grid points and now put vertex on shift right mouse button to call up this menu remember and now if I hit S now I'm in cut mode and the blue crosses only turn up when I'm over a point uh, now we can see the the blue cross is a lot better and it's by vertex so now we can create segments like this this will work with split as well but then what we're doing is we're actually slicing through the geometry there are other things to note yeah, let's turn off uh, snapping shift right mouse button and you can see your snap toggles but up here we have a little constraint zone this constraint zone you really need to look at it often because you could have problems otherwise there's no constraint attached now okay so it's the one that's going to be for up here with S on the keyboard for a snap so you can constrain to phase constrain to edge or constrain to normal a uh, normal to remind you is the orientation of the the polygon towards the outside okay what's this used for so for moving a point if I quit cut uh, right mouse button and now I just want to move this point W for move and now move it in world space which is a bit awkward if I move it in a in local space it's uh, that's even worse uh, if you if you do a point in local mode then it's just incomprehensible so let's constrain it to a face and now no matter how I move it it's it's going to stay stuck to the faces that are surrounding that, that one point. In other words, it's now the child of these adjacent faces and it will slide along them. If I choose edge instead, now it will either slide up and down the edges or left and right. Uh, be careful on your movement, your mouse, be really careful with it. Just use horizontal or vertical motions don't move in a circular fashion. Okay, now uh, with edge constraint on, 
the point will either go vertically or horizontally based on the edges that are connected to that point. And normal, well, that allows you to move it in and out of the surface. And the point will always be perpendicular to the polygon. So here are the constraint modes unique to editable polys. Now we've finished the theory, let's move on to a little exercise. So here's the little smiley head from before that I fetched. It's not brilliant, but it, it'll do for this. So perspective view can sometimes cause deformations for perspective. So what I'm going to do now is go back into configure and change the field of view down to 20, which is better for close up views and it will better keep all the proportions of my object. Okay, what we'll do now is cut and put some points on. So right mouse button, uh, I'm in sh uh, vertex snapping mode, hit S. So I can see that my mouse is stuck to the vertices. Uh, press cut and I'll n make sure the split isn't turned on. And I'll make segments in certain places. So. I'll get a segment from here to here uh, in the middle of this segment and then come back down to here. Uh, let me take off S snapping. These ones don't interest me at all, so let me just put them together. So let's for this, let's use a target world. Click here, click to the target. Click there, click to the target. Okay, now I'll move the segment down in face mode, face constraint mode. There we go. Let me turn it off. And now I'll take that face, that polygon, I'll extrude. There we go. And now I'll take the point, this point at the top, target world from here to there. There you go. Now I take these two points, that one and that one, uh, do a scale, making sure that I'm using the center target, center group. Okay. Even just with uh, just a few little uh, modifications, we can get ourselves a nose. This was just a simple sphere to start off with, remember. Now, let me take these points there, and I'll try and do a connect. And it doesn't work, obviously, because there's a, a segment in between the two bit points that I want to select. So, what shall I do now? Okay, we'll do a cut. I'll go snap and choose that point to that point. And there we go, it automatically keeps the edges that I had before. Okay, turn off snap, S. Right mouse button to turn off the tool. Take this point, move, and I'll move it down. Okay, right now we can see a little bit of character on this little character. Uh, won't go too far, obviously, in, in modeling, but all this is is just a basic exercise. Uh, loop. Uh, rotate. Move. Okay. Uh, see what this start gives in subdivision. So use NERMS and let's iterations two, and we can see what we've got just starting from a st sphere. Let's give a little bit of hardness to some s edges. So like these ones here, what we'll do is we'll just change the crease 
to give us eyebrow ridges. Changing the weight. Now I'll move the middle a bit. And there we go. Okay, let's turn off subdivision. And I can see that there aren't very many points to manipulate. Uh, put it back on. Six to quit sub-object mode and uh, see if the pinching gives a, an interesting expression for my little character. Cool. Okay, it's just a, a suggestion of a character and it allows you to start personalizing your models very simply and just train yourself like this. And now we're going to do another little detail. We've already seen that we can name or rename selections of points. So let's go here and we'll just take the points that make the corners of the mouth. So three points here and these three points on the other side. Hold down control. There we go. So now I can change scale. Making sure that this I'm using selection center. So there we go. And now that's the mouth corners, so let's do coin de bouche, which is mouth corners in French, and I'll hit enter. Now I'll take the bottom of the mouth, which is here, and I'll call it babouche, which is mouth bottom, and hit enter. So it's up to you to make your your character a little bit more personal. And however, even with just a few points like this, we can control his expressions. So we can control his aggressivity. So we could select these two edges to give a give a more pensive air. And for you to animate. To animate this is not difficult. All we need to do is turn on auto key, take the points, and I choose the ones we want. So let's take the bottom of the mouth and move it up. Move it down. Let's even scale it. And take the mouth corners and move them in and out. Move them down. Don't make them sadder. And all you need to do is go and look for the names in the selection sets and keep moving around. So you can see that if you put too many points, it gives you a form that's very it's not very easily controllable so here and if it's uncontrollable then it's not animatable and if it's not animatable that's not good but happily we did it so we're happy with what we've done okay so very simply just giving points so I can see how I can animate my little character. There you go. <laughs> okay, so here's our old friend, the teapot. I've already converted it into editable polys. I'll go into Edge, and I can see I've got Create Shape from Selection. I've selected these edges around here. If I do create shape now I can make a new line a spline uh, either on smooth or on linear uh, having said that all I need to do is select all the points on that line and uh, choose corner or smooth or bezier so I hit OK that's all now if I hit H I can see the teapot and the shape so I hit OK on the shape and now I'll move it up out of the way and I can see there's my shape that's pretty good because that allows you to make profiles so if I want to now 
put some objects around here uh, or to make a, a profile, just nothing easier. So if I create another profile, I'll just make another circle. Uh, now I'll take my line, create, compound objects, loft, get shape, and I'll click on my little circle. And there you go. That's the Okay, here it's just a teapot, so I could just take in a torus, but let's talk about another more complex form, and it allows you to take a form that exactly matches your shape that you've made. So, and in the texture section of our DVD set, it's very interesting because we can use the line of a polygon to place a texture. Ready ho! Okay, so we saw in vertex mode, edit vertex. Edit vertices, edge, edit edges, border, it's the same as edit edges, and polygon, and we've already seen that as well, with hinge for edge, extrude and bronze line, edit triangulation, retriangulate and turn, we're going to have a look at now with element, and we can see that there are some uh, interesting things like insert vertex, flip, edit tri triangulation, retriangulate and turn, we saw before. Okay, so let's hit F4 so we can see our wireframe and let's turn off subdivision okay I'm not going to select anything uh, I'm going to hit my whole form my whole object and and when you can see it's red like this is a bit bothersome so hit F2 and you'll turn off the red and it will show you the edges of the uh, polygons are red so F2 changes between so now, if I go into edit triangulation, I can see all the triangulation of my object. And not everything looks great, so I can actually change the triangulation as I want to. In the case of my character, I can see that the nose above doesn't actually need triangulation. The other polygons do. This is how edit poly works. So polygons that are triangular are going to work like edit mesh but polys that have more than three sides are going to need to be triangulated and it's automatic semi-automatic this uh, automatic quality you can actually now work with it here this is if I do right retriangulate it will try to rejoin um, in a sort of a logical sense how the polygons are subdivided. So you can hit turn and you can actually turn the triangulation as you like. This is very important when you want seams to actually be in particular places or you've got problems with the distribution of light across the surface. Okay, let's re-triangulate. Okay. Flip is to just flip the normals as you know before, so the light is inside the object. And let's Turn off turn. Insert vertex allows you to just click anywhere you like and put a vertex on a polygon. So click and the vertex is put on the surface of the polygon. Be careful, it's always going to do triangulation. And there you go, edit elements. Okay. You should be comfortable now with editing polys and segments. It's pretty simple to understand. But when you extrude polys, have you noticed how smoothing is not the same? Here we're going to just take a step to have a look at uh, smoothing in polygons. We'll make a sphere here and we'll reduce its number of segments. There we go. And now I make another sphere, but I will just put its number of segments right up, so 50. If I show segments with F4, you can actually see there's one that's got lots more than the other. If I now do Shift Q to do a render, there's something that's weird. Uh, this is something that you've got to to understand. Okay, so we can see that this one has got far fewer segments around the perimeter, around the silhouette there, it was much but around here we can see it's a lot smoother, a lot rounder. But explain to me why that hasn't changed the highlight in the center of our sphere. Well, it's part of the theory of polygonal objects. The highlight 
is pretty much the same between the two objects, uh, even though this one is has far fewer polygons. Why don't I see the, the polys? Well, watch out, this is smoothing because of the light, not smoothing because you've changed the geometry, you've smoothed the geometry out because it's subdivided. Okay, this is completely different. This smoothing is done by interpolating between the normals. Okay, the normals. Not by the number of normals, but the angle of the normals. Uh, in effect, this is a, a parameter that just smooths the the passage of the, the lighting between the two normals. Uh, this is automatically done in a primitive object. But as soon as your object stops being a primitive, it's no longer done automatically. Let's have a look at this together. Let's make a new scene. Let's just make a sphere again. I'll leave that at its default. Let me convert this to editable poly. And now I can go for a polygon. Or several polygons, why not? Okay. Now I'm going to extrude them. There we go. Uh, extrude a bit more. I'll move. Extrude a bit more. Extrude a bit more. And move. And move. Because I moved out my polygons here, I made lots of different angles. If I now do a render of my object, I can see that there's no smoothing on this area here. The smoothing is not there because it doesn't Max doesn't know how to smooth the passage of light uh, because of the changing of angle of the polygons. To be able to do that, it needs to interpret the normals of these polygons. So there's a difference between uh, the normals here and the normals here. Smoothing is going to use this difference to actually smooth out the form to make it a bit smoother. To make it look smoother. Let's have a look. It's Control A to select everything. F2 to stop the bright red. Okay, I'm in face mode, polygon mode. And now if we go down here, we can see Polygon smoothing groups. Auto smooth. Auto smooth will be done by a number, 45 here, and that's the angular value. So if I change this to 10 degrees, for instance, we can see that now all the faces, all the polygons that are at 10 degrees different orientation are smooth, and we haven't got any. But we have up here. These polygons here have got more than 10 degrees separation between them, but across my surface here, there, there's a, a smoothing angle of less than 10 degrees, which is great, but nothing here. Uh, that row of polygons there, they're smoothed, but not ones from there to the row above, or from there to the row below, because the orientation is greater than 10 degree difference. Auto smooth is like this. So now, if I put a larger value, like 40 degrees, auto smooth, and now all my geometry is smoothed. So if I come out of sub-object mode and do a quick render, and now you can see that all my polygons are smoothed. It's that simple. And that's why you've got that auto smooth on the polygon sub-object. Uh, now we'll have a look at uh, extrusion a bit more. Okay, so here's a subdivided box converted into editable polys that will allow us to go a bit further with extrude. Haven't we already seen extrude? Well, not everything. So, let's have a look. So, now let's choose this polygon, move it a bit back, that one, and that one, and that one. Oh, in fact, that one, I'm going to move it back a bit more, and, and turn it. There we go, okay. Right. So now I'll select all these front faces and I'm going to extrude. So now I can
go into extrude here, a new setting, or there, setting. They're exactly the same. Each time I do an extrude, I've got the option to change the height. And if I to choose Pi Polygon, now I can see that all the polygons are separated out. If you choose Local Normal, it will it will keep the size dependent on the normal of the previous face. But I'll choose by Polygon to separate. Okay, and so I can continue like that. Extrude, go to Settings. I just could have done Apply. I know, I know. Okay, right, like this. You can add some extra distances and we can see where I'm going here. And we'll go to scale and we'll make some nice fingers. Let's reduce size again. Apply. And let's hit OK. Right here, I'm going to start making a thumb. So turn it, scale it down, extrude, turn it again, change it scale. There we go, and so on and so forth. Keep adding more segments, uh, chamfering, looking at photos. Uh, we'll have a look at looking at photos in viewports uh, in an upcoming lesson. Okay, okay. So this type of modeling, especially with additional subdivision, you will arrive at this kind of result. Okay, there you go. That's all it is: extrusions, cuts and all the techniques I've already showed you and just done carefully. This poly object, if I now do it in NERMS, so I can see that's a pretty acceptable result for, especially for the, the thumb and for other controls. Okay, here's a head that's been modeled using the techniques we've already seen. However, sometimes if you just want to concentrate on uh, particular areas, um, there are, having the whole head present is a bit awkward at times. So in edit geometry, you can choose the geometry type you want. And if you don't want to see all of the points on the head, if all you want to do is see the face points, turn off ignore back facing. So even the points on the other side are going to be selected. I'll choose lasso selection. So all I want to do is use the uh, face. So if I select everything else, and now I just go down in here, edit geometry, scroll down, hide selected. And then all the points are hidden. So now all I see is the, are the points that are on the face itself. I can do the same thing with polygons. So if I select the polygons that are around the body without the face, I'll just select all uh, those, and then I can do so hide selected there. And now all I can see is the face. I can just concentrate on that. I can look on the outside or even on the inside, as long as I'm using uh, wireframe, obviously, so that it shows you the inside. Okay, so that's pretty handy. That allows you to just work on a specific area without having a very heavy scene. You can also use NERMS just on this area that you're working on. Okay, that's nice. If you just want to see everything again, it's not very difficult. All you need to do is go into the object mode, sub-object mode, so points here. Go into the edit geometry part, go down, unhide all. And now I can see all the points, I can select them all as I like, and they're all displayed. If I want to see the polygons as well, let's go, go into sub-object polygons, and I can do unhide all there. That's how in editable polys to optimize your working area. In edit geometry, I, I can also see a mesh smooth, M smooth. Uh, don't confuse it with the smoothing, which works by lighting. Mesh smooth actually subdivides your geometry. So if 
we hit settings I can if I don't select anything I can subdivide all my geometry so watch out for your value but here because you could actually end up with some pretty disastrous results so if I select particular polygons so let's take the face as an example I won't go into mesh smooth because you can see that um, the mesh smooth is going to take place only on the face which is pretty interesting because if this person has a wig or a haircut or whatever I don't really need to see the head polygons behind the face it's just the front that does so I can take a bigger zone and the preview will adapt if I go into wireframe mode I can actually see how it triangulates let's go back here and that will adapt automatically. You can do a mesh smooth here, so like this, the first level, apply, and now a second level, even more smoothed there. But watch out for the triangulation of the junctions between one level and another, which can sometimes give you a, a disastrous result that you don't really want. So now, there you go, a smoothing that is localized, cancelled. Mesh smooth is a, a subdivision that's that's pretty much correct. However, if we use a different one, tessellate, it's it's a special kind of subdivision. If I take a polygon here, tessellate is going to divide that face uh, uh, by its edges. So I could do it by its uh, face instead. So how does that work? So if I hit on F2, so I don't have that glowing red area. So if I hit Edge, I can see that it's subdivided based on the edges that are already there. I sort of connect. By ticking Edge, what I'm doing is going from the segments that already exist and go to the other ones. So it's exactly the same as Connect, really. Uh, there's one other thing that you can have tension what's tension if I look now I can see if I divide this polygon it's still flat well of course you might say but that's not what I want what I want is to maintain that curve across the chest by lifting this area up so that I keep the curve across my chest and not stay flat Okay, well this is possible. All we need to do is change the tension. So as you can see, I'm moving that point up and down. However, just with one point, it's no good. So let's select the whole line down and now change the tension and lift up that area. If I do face, then it triangulates so you can't change the tension. It's just going to be flat. Tessellate, or polygonize, offers these two options. We've seen Mesh Smooth and Tessellate. Okay, we've seen Mesh Smooth, we've seen Tessellate, and we've got Make Planar. But be careful if you've got the whole object and you do Make Planar, uh, it's just going to become completely flat. It's not necessarily what I want. Control Z. Okay, instead, what I'll do is I shall select some of these points I'm in lasso mode always take those ones and I'll hit delete and now I'll select these ones and I'll make planar make planar you've got to be careful what axis you've chosen so control Z so I'll do it on X uh, no uh, Y mm, that's not much better um, in Z mode that's more interesting. Now I've made a nice flat line of my points on the z-axis of local to the object. Okay, you can also align to the view or align to the grid. So you can align to the grid, which is not always very useful. It depends on where your grid is positioned. So here we've got to be careful where our head is in relation to the grid. So if you want to do that. Take your object and put it 
on the grid properly. So you could go to Edit, Transform, Transform Toolbox, Center. And now if we move the object up a bit, and then we can go back to our points, and now do Grid Align. And now all the points are aligned exactly to the grid. Uh, this is better if you use Soft Selection. So we go Use Soft Selection, and change the fall off. Then you can use uh, down here, align to the grid, and now it will influence. It will be influenced by the soft selection. So cool. Align to the view is depending on on the view. Uh, here it's a bit bizarre, but if you're looking at your person from above, let's take off soft selection. There we go, and then you hit align to the view. Now all the points have got, have been aligned to where I was looking from. So we can see that I was looking from here. That's my eye. Got blue eyes. And looking down. And so the the points were aligned perpendicular to my point viewpoint. There you go. So once you've aligned points, we've got a little problem here. This uh, there's huge great polygons here, so we've got relax that will allow you to Mm, no, move them. It's a bit daft, so let's go back to soft selection. And now, with use soft selection, I can do my relax. I can tell where I'm going to do it, and I can move my points so that they fit better with the points that I aligned. There we go. All right, so there's an application of relaxing. We're going to have a look now at a thing that's pretty interesting. It's subdivision displacement. What's that then exactly? Your object is going to be automatically subdivided by textures, levels of gray. And what's we're going to see now? With very few things, I'm just going to make a sphere here. Just a simple sphere, nothing else, just a sphere, and then I'll make it into a polygon. Convert to editor polys. There we go. Right now, uh, it's not our goal at the moment right now to look at materials or lights or anything, but we have to have a look to understand theory of polygons and particularly dif displacement. So displacement is going to use these gray levels to move points on an object. So the problem is that if the quantity of points on your object is lower than the resolution of your grayscales of your d map, you're going to have a bad result. We'll see that now. Let's hit M on the keyboard to hit see the material editor. This is just a little showing it. So let me drag and drop this so now it's got this material on it. Now I'm going to close all and I'm just going to go into maps and I can see down here displacement. So it's 100 units by default but this is too big so let's just change it down to 10. And now I'll click on where it says none I'll add a grayscale map so I can either load a bitmap, an image on the hard drive or for this example I'm just going to put a noise texture. Noise is a fractal image that is generated by your computer. I'm going to hit OK. Now if I do a render, uh, you can't really see a lot of difference. So let's go up to my default level, I'm the top level of my material, so I can raise the displacement. Let's put it to 50 instead. And we can see that the uh, little thumbnail moves, and it's moved in our thumbnail, but it's not very good, really. So it's probably because the mesh on our object is not detailed enough. So to do this, we'll go down, go down, and we can see not subdivision surface, but subdivision displacement. Well, if we activate that, this is going to allow us to choose three presets, low, medium, and high. So if we use low and hit shift Q and we can see oh there's our result. Let's do medium now 
and a bit more detailed and high and look a lot better subdivision there the calculation times grow as you change the subdivision preset level so if I go back into noise and I'll just look at the noise so the displacement is based on the levels of grey and the greys are not very contrasty here so let's just uh, up the low value so we get more contrast here it's a little bit soft here uh, so we're on regular noise at the moment so we'll do fractal and it will be a little bit sharper and now yeah look now we can see the difference really well between black and white now we can see that the differences are much more accentuated on my object let's go back to high and now we can really see the result that we we obtain vertices that are white because of our image will be pushed up so how does it work so displacement so it's, it subdivides the form only at render time so it's going to use the values here of white of gray and black to push up based on the value of the displacement so the value was 50 so there are 50 divisions between the white 25 where it's grays and zero where it's black and that's exactly what on the other hand if my sphere doesn't have enough geometry not enough not enough points then it would be impossible to displace with as much detail as this but you don't really need to have a, an enormous subdivision when you're in the viewport so this is a process of what we would call post-production this is a process that takes place during rendering okay if I go back up now I will add some more displacement let's go 200 there if I do another render and that's what I get and now if I do minus 200 and now I will have holes in my sphere with these options uh, which can be changed low medium and high you can change your parameters and you can see here low medium and high have different values the bigger the numbers the lighter the the rendering the smaller the numbers there are more subdivision and the render times are longer so it's playing with these little things I'll just put myself at minus 20 and do another render. If we play with these values and with different types of image, you can obtain this sort of render. Now, here there's no modeling. These are all just spheres with displacement. So now we're going to see another little thing, um, something, because we've already seen the material editor a little bit. Uh, we're going to have a look at something else with materials. Okay, I made my teapot. I'm going to convert it to editable poly and I'll go into polygons. I'm going to close everything and go into polygon material IDs. Okay, so I'll select mm, this area of the teapot here and I'll say that's set ID 1. Okay, if I have a look in smoothing groups I can see that number one is activated. But let's personalize this. So we'll say it's number five instead. Okay. Okay. ID identifier. Okay. Let's invert my selection. Control I, which hasn't worked. Okay. You've got to quit the mode there. And now Control I. There we go. My selection's inverted. So I hit control to deselect a little bit of it. Uh, take off this one. Uh, no. Okay, bigger. If you want to deselect a, a large block like this, it's alt, not control. Control is for uh, clicking on one uh, polygon at a time. Okay, all this bit, I will give it an ID number 2. Okay, and now 
this bit down here uh, with control uh, there we go and I'll put this one with ID 3 if I select by ID select ID 3, select ID 2 select ID 1 uh, select ID uh, 5 then I've got the selections I might put uh, now these are just n numbers for selection okay why did I speak to you about materials because there are different techniques so what I'm going to show you now is a bit old-fashioned but and there's better but why not okay so we're going to the material editor M on the keyboard exactly the same thing now if I put a material on the object now you can see you've got the material covering the whole things but you can also have multiple materials so based on the IDs that I've created so here I put in different IDs so that type of material is not a standard one but it's a multi or sub object or multi stroke sub object material so let's select that, double click on it uh, okay okay and now I've got the IDs. So all I do is change the color, and that's what that will show you what it's doing. Okay, that's number one. Number two, choose that color. Okay, number three, uh, light blue. Yeah, number four, there isn't one. And uh, no. Nope. And number five. Let's just make it white. And there you go, that's how you can assign different materials or different colours to a single object. And obviously, to go much further, you go, should go to the training on uh, materials, lighting, textures and UV creation. Next up, I'll show you another technique that's much faster, that will allow you to much better understand material IDs. Okay, so why did I show you this uh, ancient idea for how to do materials? This is a bit old-fashioned, because it's not very rapid. This is how I work in production. M for Material Editor. There you go. Alright, now I take my object, a teapot, and now what I'll do, I will, I'll go really fast, okay? So I don't worry about this sub-object, I just go polygon, I wait, I don't select anything, take the material, drag it on the object, give it a colour, a nice visible colour, really tasteful. Now I take polygons. Now let me take the polygons uh, for the base of the teapot here, like this, a bit better than that, some more, yeah okay and I'll give it another material drag and drop I'll change the color always very tasteful as you can see right now I'm going to element mode I'll take the cover I'll take the spout and the handle and I'll drag and drop another material on them I'll take this one I'll change its color again tasteful what have I done right I've done one selection there which was the whole object and it's important, you should do this. And then I've just dragged and dropped the material onto it. Then I've taken sub-objects, so it will only work with polygons and elements. Uh, edges and borders and vertex will not work with shaders. Ooh, shaders, new word. Uh, this is a shader, it's a texture, it's a material. This is how the light is going to react to our object. So, I made another selection here, sub-objects in polygons and then I dragged this one on there and then elements I took the spout and the top and the handle and I dragged and dropped again so now I made three different types of material okay very simple now so if I take an empty one here and uh, the eyedropper so I'll click on the object and now we can see one two three they're all in a multi-material. Now we've got, this is the old time of multi-material, which had loads of different free entries. But with this one, I've only got the ones 
that I've used. And if I now go into Polygon and I select ID uh, 2, select, and obviously I'm going to select those base polygons, the green ones. If I go to 3, select, and I've got the elements, and if I go uh, on the one and select and that's the rest of the teapot and it's the the purple bit of the teapot the other advantage is that directly you can actually rename your surfaces okay so here we'll see a bit more a bit later on so this is how you can go a lot faster with materials it's a choice obviously so now obviously go in and see textures and UV and lights and materials. Okay, we're now going to see tools to help you model. Uh, what I'm calling modeling helpers here are things that will help you to create your object, but you're not actually just messing around with the points and the edges and the vertices and so on. What I'm calling here is uh, deformation cages, for instance. So if we looked at that in the fundamentals section, but we'll go a bit further now. Let's go to extended primitives, chamfer box, and draw out our box like so. There we go. Hit F4 to see the subdivision. So let's change the number of segments. There we go. Let me change the fillet and the subdivision in the fillet. Okay. Right, what I'm going to do now is add an FFD, a freeform deformer. There are several different ones. There's a 2x2x2, 3x3x3, 4x4x4, box or cylinder. The last two, it's you how that, that decides the type of subdivision you want. The uh, FFD is going to work a bit like NURBS in the sense that you have a cage outside your object, but a bit simpler. So here I'm not going to use the 2-2, two -two. I'm going to use a 4x4, four four. so a bit of an all-terrain kind of freeform deformer. Okay, so let's go to the components, control points, and now I'm going to modify certain bits. So simply with scale, so using the same tools as before. This is what I use FFDs often for making things like I'm trying to do now, which is kind of uh, remote controls, mice, uh, portable phones, that kind of thing. This goes so fast to have some kind of shape that's fast and gives an idea of what you want. So we can see it developing, and it's so fast. Okay. Scale it in a bit and move it down. Okay, let me okay, take these couple of points in the middle here and move them down. Okay. Right, like this. We've rapidly made some kind of shell. Okay, lots of solutions here. We can make it into editable polys or work with the points and segments and polys. I can go to the modifiers menu, mesh editing, edit poly. Edit poly. What it does, it does exactly the same as edit poly, basically. It's pretty much the same thing. Except you're not converting, which allows you to take certain parts. There we go. Delete. Take again. Cap it. Take that. Inset. Move it in a bit. Extrude it out again. Scale it. And like that. So here's our rapidly created shape. Of course, you can look down in the... Oh, watch out. If you go down in the stack, you can see this error message, which if you go down, you're risking 
influencing the topology of your object. So if you change the points in the chamfer box or the segments, then you may destroy what uh, steps you've done above. It's a bit like going back in time. It's a, a problem, perhaps. Uh, don't see this message again, and I hit yes. Now let's go to the FFD, and in the control points, I can modify certain points. So I see here that it's a bit too much, so let's just narrow it down a bit. Mm. Oh, yep, yeah, okay, good. Uh, let me s change the scale of these ones as well. This allows me to continue to work on my object in poly or whatever, but if I go all the way down to chamfer box, I might actually change the topology and the order of points. The order of the points uh, the points are numbered for the lines and the lines are numbered for the polygons so here let's be sure edit and hold and we're going to chamfer box let's change the length segments and then it, it messes up what I've done afterwards uh, okay All right. so there are things that I can change like the length or the width or the height, um, perhaps even the fillet. And if I get back up to the FFT, I can go back up to the edit poly and see my object again. Let me have a look in top view. And now I'll make a line. Like so. Now I'll go back to perspective view. And I think you know me a bit better now, so what I'm going to do, uh, let's go back to my object, take a polygon, or the point, the face that's here, extrude along spline, pick the spline, pick that one, and there we go. Align to normal, um, no, perhaps not. Uh, let's add some segments in, let's add some taper in, Okay. Okay. Now I can take these tail sections in soft selection. So I can move it along there. So I can move the mouse to the side uh, and rotate it around a little. And move it again. And there you go. Possibilities of using an edit poly modifier on your object. If we come back to chamfer box, we can change the size, length, height, width, change the fillet, anything size related, just not segments, okay? Let's carry on a bit with the freeform deformers FFDs. So there's my object. I'm going to put Turbo Smooth on it. Modifiers, Subdivision Surfaces, Turbo Smooth. Okay, I'm going to put it on three iterations, uh, but that's going to slow down my viewports. So, there's several things we can do. We can right mouse button on Turbo Smooth and say Off in Viewport. And then it's, it's not active in the viewport, but when I render, it's going to be there. As we can see here, for example. You could put it to zero, and when you do a render, it's to zero. So four now. And now you can see that the render is chugging with all the polygons because it's very subdivided. Okay, so if I want to put the FFD on there, I want to put it underneath Turbo smooth, but above editable poly. Let's we've seen those predefined ones. Let's choose the box. Now I can set the number of points. So I can make a non-uniform selection, or I can make them all the same. There we go. So I'm only working on volume, and here I've got uh, tension and continuity. So this is 
the manner in which they will pull the mesh towards themselves in the FFD. Very good. Let's have a look at this one. Shift Q. And I can compare my different renders by clicking on the two little men there that allows me to have two render windows open. Change the tension. Do another rapid render, rapid render, rapid render. And we can see how it's changed. So, like this. Modifying the tensions, you can change the com you can completely change the character of your object just by modifying the FFD. There you go, just with a single model but with an FFD over the top. Okay, let's put my tensions back to what they were. Uh, okay, that's a bit odd. Now, we can see, yes, quite alien. Right, okay. Let's put normal tension on there, and I'll now move the points. Uh, points in the FFD apply on everything, so I don't really want to use them. So let's choose the points on my editable poly. Okay, I can see that I've got my points selected in soft selection, so I can now do FFD 4x4 four four just to the points I've got selected. This FFD is going to work just on the points of the object. So if I do a change in scale, or move to give him a bit of a facelift, okay, we can just lift his face up a bit more, and we change the scale again. Now I'll do a render. Oh, yeah, there you go. He already looks younger with FFD. Turn off the FFD. And I'll do another render. Oh, yes. Mm. Okay. Now, we'll try and make him younger again. A bit younger. Let's turn on the FFD. And let's make him thinner. And do a render. And there's my character. Turn off FFD. Let me click on render again. Oh, and yes, you can see his face is much thinner. So changing like this with the FFD, you can make him younger without having to actually change your model at all. This is one of the applications of FFD. Is there a way of being more accurate? Let's see. Right, so let's try and personalize an FFD. Okay, so let's go into sub-object mode. We'll choose my vertices there. And now I'll go to modifiers FFD4. And I'm going to personalize it. So I'll go to set volume. The points on the FFD become green. And now you can move them to match your object. Which allows you to be a little bit closer when you're modifying. You don't have to interpolate. The The fact that you're in set volume, you're not actually changing anything apart from the cage of the FFD. So the FFD is not going to affect anything. This allows you to have a better control of your, your the volume of your original object. So let's, uh, let's move those in. So let's go into control points. Uh, no, well, let's, yeah, is that good? Okay, we're we'll going to control points. And now if we move the control points, Turn off source volume, and now you can see that you're controlling the points of the FFD but a lot closer to your original object, so it's a lot easier to control how my character looks. So, lift his cheeks up, and I can reposition the points as I like, even animate them. Uh, this kind of point is completely animatable. All you need to do is click it and then click on Auto key. Because uh, the control here is pretty vague, it, you, there's not much interest having an animation, but it allows you to have a closer control over your model. That's how you use FFVs a different way. 
And so here's a really speedy tip on how to use FFDs. So if you don't want to have to move your points closer to your geometry by yourself, you also have control points conform to shape. Automatically, it will try and put the points on the FFD as close as possible to the geometry. Be careful on geometry. It depends on the geometry. Simple geometry, easy. Even this teapot is proving a bit of a problem. You can do a reset just to put them back to your cage. Okay, here are little tips for FFDs. The best thing is to use set volume, but conform to shape, and you can change the offset, reset, conform to shape, and now you can see the shape is a bit further offset. That allows you to give you a bit of a space between the actual geometry and the FFD. Obviously, some forms that come out of the object a lot aren't very well understood. So, what's the difference between um, FFDs, freeform deformers, and parametric deformers? Well, they're roughly the same things as deformers, both of them. So, before there were only FFDs. So, when you wanted to, let's say, make a cylinder like this, quite tall, and you wanted to bend it over, to be able to do this, you had to make an FFD to put around the box, uh, put around the cylinder, and then turn the, the points, and then you could bend the cylinder. But it was a bit laborious. So when the parametric deformers came out, that was much better. It's just basically FFDs are pre-programmed, with sometimes with things that are a bit more complex. But that's what I'll show you now. The the easiest one to understand is, is that one that I've just explained. So uh, we use a cylinder, and I use the bend parametric deformer on it. So let me go on it. So now, full screen, modifiers, parametric deformers, bend. Bend allows you to bend. And there we go. Nothing simpler than that. You can choose its direction. But watch out which axis you're going to use to bend on. Okay. Okay, the bend is made of its own gizmo uh, and its center, about which the angle uh, leaves, if you like. So you, you don't have to leave the center where it is. If you limit effect, you can change the upper limit and the lower limit. So it's a bit weird because it's based on the center of your gizmo. So let's lift the center and then we'll change that to zero. And you can understand it a bit better now. We can have a straight, straight, straight portion, a bend and a straight portion. So the bend is now only working on the center and in that little bit. So what you need to do is put the center where you want it, use the lower limit at zero, and then it will be there. So for the other one, it's going to go up to X percent of the whole distance. So in that value is what's determining it. The angle is the angle of the bend. And direction is around the compass where it's going. Bend can work on the whole object or it can be based on the topology of your object. Example, let's reset. If I make a teapot now, our old friend, uh, if I convert it into polys, if I select some vertices, uh, use soft selection. Now, if I add a freeform, def uh, parametric deformer, bend, now the spout will work like this. So I can see directly it's going to put the point in the middle. Let me move the center to the end of the spout. Let's change the angle and then change the direction. Or axis maybe. X is probably the best axis here. OK. Uh, if you want to move the gizmo, you can do. Rotate or whatever you like for whatever 
you like for your modifications. Don't forget to move the center afterwards. So, And now modify the angle. If you've got some movement that you don't really want uh, in the vertices, you can come back to the vertices and <laughs> activate the the toggle so you can see the modification and modify your fall off. Okay. Of course, you can take other parts of the object, but be careful because it, it will be bizarre. It will be bizarre. Don't worry. Okay, there you go. A uh, quick explanation without really going into great depth on, on bend. But uh, we'll have a look at all the parametric deformers later on. Uh, we're going to start from the bottom of the list and we're going to go through all of them. And they're kind of in alphabetical order. But uh, W and X are a bit bizarre. Uh, S and T, mm, they start at the beginning, but then afterwards it's very artistic. So let's start at the bottom, and we'll see each one after the other. Let's continue with our friend Bend. Okay, so here we've got a little pot thing, and we've got our line, and we've lathed it. Too many segments, so let's just change the steps down to mm, two. That would that would do. Okay, the form. The shape isn't well aligned, so let, we could go to Transform Toolbox, and we could center, but let's move the center point, the pivot point. We'll put it on Z minimum and center it. Z minimum, okay. Now, the pivot point is now uh, in the center of the pot at the bottom, the minimum, and that's based on the order of creation. Okay, so my object, now it's at the bottom. If I hit center now, my object is centered on the grid and sitting on top of it. So Z to get closer. In my active viewport, which is perspective view, uh, less Alt W to maximize. Okay, now let's keep this topology, but uh, let's add mesh editing, edit poly. Okay, let's take edit poly and I'll take a polygon here, that one. And now I'll extrude. I have the extrude settings and I'll do extrude height. I'll do one, apply, two, and three. That's three. Okay. All right. There's my extrusion. Okay. Now let me take these points and now I'll take a modifier, parametric deformers, bend. Now if if I bend, what do I get? This is what I get. Uh, check on the axis. So Z, mm, X, uh, Y. Uh, what axis should I work on? So in this case, X. No, Y, definitely not. And Z, uh, not really. Ah, but let's change the direction. Okay, that's more interesting now. Okay, I think the best direction is probably going to be 90 degrees and on the z-axis. Uh, but the center is in the middle of the bend. So uh, there you can see. So if I go in wireframe, you can really see it. So let me move the center over here. And now there aren't any more problems so that we get the bend that we want uh, for the handle of the cup that we want to make. Uh, the angle is not bad. Uh, the direction uh, uh, now we have to look at the gizmo and it needs to be oriented correctly to the side of the cup so uh, so it's very important to manipulate different things to make sure the settings are exactly as you want them to be so the gizmo is right now and the direction is right 90 degrees at the angle uh, okay very good now you can of course move the gizmo so that you can move the handle around as you like. Uh, that's better. So there we go. That's that's good for the handle. Now let's add an extra edit poly. Of course you can work differently. You can actually just copy and paste it or you can add another modifier. Edit poly. Ah, whoops. B 
be careful on the order in which you put it. So you want it above the bend. So now we take the, f the polygon here and here and we'll delete them. Then we'll take the open edges here and change its scale a little. And the one that's here as well. And I'm going to use bridge. You know the one. A connection, automatic connection is made. Okay. All right. If I come back to bend now, I can now modify the bend, and the bridge will automatically adapt to where I've moved the bend to. So, like this, we could actually move the gizmo and change the shape of our handle. Okay, for you now to play as you like, subdivide here. So let's add a an turbo smooth and a couple of iterations, and there we go. There's our handle. And now we understand how stack order is important. So that allows us with this form to be able to work with it. We'll turn off F4, and let's have a look again. So if we come back to the gizmo, we can change the way the handle sits where it, and how big it is and this is very important to be able to work in this way and now we can understand a lot better this kind of shape here we covered the other ones already really other modifiers okay so other modifiers we've got the lists here parametric deformers we can see them and we're going to look at wave and ripple we're going to use the both of them because they're similar. Ripple and wave. Wave is a directional and ripple is a radial wave. Okay, let's do that now. Let's make a plane. And I'll um, subdivide it a bit. 20, 20. Okay. Okay, let's make it this size, roughly. Let me make a, a cylinder here, and then I'll copy it over there. And I'll, I'll use an instance there. Why an instance? Well, because that allows me to change one cylinder and affect them both. What do I mean by attributes there? So I don't really need height segments. So let's just one. There we go. Now I'll make a box. And I'll lift up above the pillars of the pier. Okay, let me take off the uh, subdivision overlay F4. And on this plane, I'm now going to put a ripple. So a circular wave, if you like. That's a ripple. You can have an amplitude there, and a second amplitude if you want. Amplitudes 1 and 2 mean that you can have an amplitude this direction, and one in the other direction that allow you to have uh, some kind of asymmetry and we can see it when we change it okay now uh, you've got the wave length and the wave phase and obviously all this is animatable to make waving water decay is pretty much the, the fall off the the attenuation of the waves so there's the zone of influence and it just peters out okay so it's the decay right the ripple has its own gizmo and its center so let's move the center quicker line to the column okay All right and now we can see ripple and I can change its wavelength or whatever. And, well, I want a second one. It's not difficult. Let's just copy the ripple. And we'll paste it. Not instance, but just paste. Okay, so now we've got a second one. And take the center, and I'll put it on the other cylinder. Okay. Okay. Now, we need a little bit more subdivision on the, on the plane, I think. Either we change it here or we just add another modifier so let's add subdivision service turbo smooth 
And there we go. We can. We've got a result that's a little bit more realistic. Okay, now I'm going to add some waves. Now go down to wave on parametric deformers. There you go. And they're on all the geometry. And again here, same thing. You've got the same amplitudes, which can be asymmetrical. And a wavelength. And the phase. And the decay. Okay. What I advise here if you want to do more realistic things is work the decay a little bit and change the gizmo rather than the center so this is the influence on the box of on the whole object and they're done in an exponential manner from the center of the box okay so let me rotate it that's nice um, move it a little bit okay Therefore, waves are arriving. So now I can copy it. And this time I'm going to do paste instanced. What this does, if you move one, the other one will move as well. If you modify it, the other one modifies as well. So how can you tell that it's an instance? Because it's italicized. So you can make it unique by clicking there. So, so you can just see that instances work like this. Okay, let me move the gizmo a bit and rotate it a bit. There you go. Now I've got the different waves and that can give me a, a better realism on for the waves. Obviously, for animating this, all you need to do is click on Auto Key and going all the way up to the end there and change the parameters, change the movement of the gizmo there you go like a wave breaking on the shore uh, the changing of phases or or the decay or whatever and it's exactly the same with the ripples we go to the ripple and we'll just change the, the phase there you go 1.6 control C and the two ripples should be about the same so let's put control V in there 1.6 and now now we've got a result that is the animation that's identical on the two columns and some nice breaking waves you've got the wave modifiers here and turbo smooth is in the middle I'd met turbo smooth at the top of the stack and then you can close each modifier they will look too similar so you can always rename them as you like right mouse button rename there you go vague not vague it means wave in french what a relaxing scene okay so that's the technique for using waves and ripples the x form modifier okay we'll go in modifiers uh, parametric it's the second one from the bottom and it will allow us to add a new top level to our object X is for transform move rotate scale and T is for and form is for transform so this allows us to act on a modifier rather than directly on the object so X form allows us to choose a bit of the geometry adding the parametric deformer X form uh, what's this good for well, now we can do different modifications. Uh, the X form modifier has a gizmo and uh, the center, just like any other modifier. And by moving the center point around and within the bounds of its bounding box, our transformations will take place. The center will be like a pivot point. So if I do rotate there with the center point there, I can see that the rotation is made around that pivot point. Okay. And let me cancel that lot. And I'll put my center where I'm going to need it. I'm going to put it on, this, on the last vertebrae in the spine. The advantage of this new object space is that it inherits what's in Editable Poly. So let's go in here. So I'll simply 
go back to the gizmo there and do a rotation. Very good. Okay, now I'll go back into the stack and I'll go in vertices. Let me click on here so we can see everything. And we can see that everything is being displayed and not only is it displaying the points, uh, also the gizmo and all the rest. Seeing all the points displayed can be a bit bothersome. So let's go and reduce the size of the points. So customize, preferences, viewports, and change that down to two. Okay. All right, now the points are a little bit smaller and we can more easily see what we want. And now I can see my mesh a bit better so I can see the transformation. Okay, right. Now, what I'm going to do is work a little bit more cleanly on my selection of points. I'm going to make a selection here, just with a bounding box. There we go. And then I'm going to use a soft selection. Okay, so up the fall off, and I can see immediately that how the changes are made. This allows me to work uh, with the soft selection for my selection over the top. So if I just take this bit of the head, so I can see that it's only working on this piece. If I go back to vertex, turn off soft selection, uh, up the fall off, there we go. And now we can see that the selection is attenuating and I can see more. I can see that this is done in a soft selection method. Okay. Okay, let's carry on working in this principle. Right, so now what we'll do is select vertices, but in another way. What I'm going to do is do paint. I'm going to paint my selection. So there we go. There's the paintbrush. Let's control shift to change its size, and I'll keep painting. Keep painting my selection. What I'm going to paint is the muscular attachments for the skull. A bit more rigidity here and a bit softer here at the base of the neck. There we go. Uh, let me paint on a blur to make more of a, a smooth fall off along the neck. There we go. Very good. Now, if I go on X form, gizmo, I can might rotate my gizmo. There we go. And we can easily see that the neck is quite good, but the back of the neck isn't so good. So let's go back in and change my vertex selection. A bit more paint. Uh, on the soft selection. Okay, and paint there a bit lower down so that the back of the head is well encompassed. Okay, go back to Gizmo, rotate, and now I can see that's much better for a simple little manipulation. That's much better use of Gizmo and of its bounding box. With this little exercise, this shows you how you can use paint to deform your object uh, very simply. Like this, we've got a new object space, a new bounding box, a new top level that we can manipulate easily with if we want. A center that we can move around that we can consider as a pivot point. There we go, let's turn everything off and so I can have a look at what it gives me. Mm, okay, uh, the influence of the paint on the, note, uh, on the nose isn't very good. So let's go back here. Uh, we can see there's a variation of the color here. So all we'll need to do is go back to vertex, uh, go back to soft selection, go back to paint and just paint over here so that it goes redder. That's pretty easy. The fact that we've now done it here 
if we now go back to X form, it's changed what we've done. So, there you go. For some things, you really don't need a massive animation toolkit. The modifier we're going to look at now, it, we could have done it in the fundamentals uh, because it's so simple and it, for optimization of the scene. However, because it's in parametric deformers, we're going to have a look at it now and it's substitute. So let's make a teapot and we could use a much more complex object for this to really be obvious. Uh, but there's a box. So I set my teapot, I go into parametric deformers and I check out substitute. Now pick scene object and there you go. What's happened? Well, my teapot's become a box. Okay, so it's been substituted for the box. There's my substitute object, but you don't really need to. But you can also go here, or you can just reload it in the scene. So now you, when you see it in the render, it's just a box. If I untick render there, now I see in the render my teapot. But, of course, when the viewport is active, I just see the box. Let me hide my other box. There we go. Right now, in my scene, uh, I'm going to animate my box, my teapot, remember. Uh, now I'm going to add another deformer. Uh, let's add bend, for instance. I'll animate the bend. Change the angle of the bend. Okay, that's pretty good. Now, if I look at the render time, that's still being applied to the teapot. So shift Q rapidly just to show you the, the and that's the principle of substitute. It allows you to substitute one object for another. We've still got a bunch of other modifiers, so let's start by making a cylinder. Okay, so now we'll have a look at other things, especially for combination. So let's have a look at new things. That's the whole goal. Modifiers, parametric deformers, taper. Taper allows you to, as its name indicates, taper your object. So you can deform like this. The taper can be at the top or at the bottom, depending on where your gizmo is. Okay, so if I go down here like a cone, I can obviously go too far and get things a bit bizarre like that. Very good. Okay. I can also change the curve so I can blow up the side of my taper or, or make it skinnier. So I can do, I can make it asymmetric if I want. And obviously I've got the limits as well. So now if I put another deformer bend on top, then I can bend that form. Watch out that your cylinder has enough segments in in height so that it stays nice and smooth. And we're fine like this. That we've got taper and bend. It's good, but be careful on the order because if you put bend before taper, then you make something a bit special. Okay, let's have a look. Let's delete this. Right, now I'm going to put the bend modifier on first. So let's bend it over. And now I'll put taper. Bingo. That's just bizarre. That's not the same result at all. So think carefully about the order in which you put modifiers on your object. Because it doesn't always give the same results. It can often give bizarre results. Let's get rid of the bend. Taper allows you to just make a cone-shaped object uh, squish in the top. Uh, here we can see that the order is important. The order is important and the gizmo is adapted automatically to the original form, the original shape. So once you're already in an error like this, the easiest thing to do is just start again, but in the right order. So we'll start with our taper. Really think well before you do what you want to, before you get into this kind of problem. So there we go. Uh, the order of the modifier stack is very important. The twist. Okay, if I take my object now and I go modifiers, parametric deformers, twist. 
twist. Oh, it is this turning. There's nothing around there. There's nothing over there. Okay. And you can just quick one bit more, bit more, bit more. So let's twist again. Let's continue our adventure in modifiers by going in and extended primitives and choose chamfer box. There we go. And let's add some segments in there. Press F4 to see them. Ka ching ka chung ka chung. There we go. Right. What are we going to do now? We're going to add a modifier that let's duplicate this object first. There we go. Two copies. And now let's add a modifier there. Parametric deformers squeeze. Squeeze just allows you to squeeze an object. Uh, so it's amusing enough. Why did I make several? Because you can now see that if I just drag and drop this modifier on an object, if I drag and drop the modifier with control held down, now the modifier is italicized and that means it's instanced. There you go, and you can make it unique by clicking here and then it's unique and it's no longer instanced. Let's go on to the Spherify modifier. Okay, well, it depends on the kind of object you're using it with. If I do it on the teapot, mod modifier, parameter, deformer, Spherify. There uh, you go. This poor little teapot is just made into a sphere. Uh, it's pretty simple. There's nothing to deal with. There you go. If you change your object to and from being spherical. And this is about the pivot point. Okay, so if I move my teapot over here, just move the auto key to there, hit 100%. There you go. That simple. Let me try on the cube. Spherify. There we go. Easy peasy. However, if now I try on the text, what's it going to do? Add Spherify. Ooh! Uh, that's not really very good. It's because of the type of the modeling you're doing. You can see this trying to get this, but it's not really succeeded. Okay, so Spherify works well with some types of modeling, but not all. The modifier we're going to look at next often helps in animation to do uh, make squash and stretch effects like balls or, or rubber so stretch so there we go that's what it does very good but not to, con to confuse with just merely squash and stretch on the scaling tool that looks similar but it's not a deformer that's added to the object it's the object itself and you shouldn't do it because you know that if your object is in a part of a hierarchy you will risk the hierarchy and you will probably have problems have a look back at the fundamentals DVD if you need to okay All right let's reset and make a sphere and we'll tick base to pivot okay there we go uh, now I'm just going to look in the top, in the front view, and I'm going to go and add modifiers, parametric deformers, stretch. Now what I'm going to do is go into animation, just to amuse ourselves. So, here we go, move, and I'll put it up there. Now I'll move it back down to the floor. Okay and so on and so forth so every 20 frames by example there we go up there and down there okay so there's our movement when it's on the ground it's sometimes good to have a little bit of latency a little bit of a pause so like an object i can hold down shift and just duplicate my key before i start up again and i'll do the same from one for 80 there we go. And now, for example, I can take the, 
this movement and do this with it. Okay, so now all is very simple. I'll stay in animation mode and I'll add stretch in there. And as it's when it's on the ground and it's going up, well, let's stretch it out a bit and um, we'll give it a bit of a rotation. So it's heading in the direction of the stretch. And there we go. And as it's coming back down to ground, we'll turn the rotation back around and we'll we'll change the stretch back to normal. And then straight immediately afterwards when we're in our pause, let's squish down. And so now I'll get that bounce. As soon as I take off again, let's take the stretch back up and turn our rotation around. Okay, so the result, there we go, bouncing. And let me do it here again. Change my rotation back around the other way. Change my stretch down to zero. Go on to the next frame. Change my stretch to squish more. A little bit more, there we go. And now rotate so I can take off again. And here, let's change the stretch back up again. So now, there we go, we've got a little bouncing bean. Pretty simple. Play for a bit for yourself and learn the modifier like that. The next modifier allows you to twist your object. Uh, it's called skew. There we go. And now you can actually skew your object. You can do it in two directions, like this, and axes as well, and the direction, and you've got your gizmo in the center and so on. Now, of course, this are things that you could have a look yourself at. Don't forget uh, that all these modifiers can be done on the whole object, or you could actually do another modifier in there, Edit poly, for example, and take the points at the top of the teapot. And now we can see that the modifier, the skew modifier, is only happening on the top points. So we can add a soft selection so that it smooths out the action now. So playing with the direction, we can, you can amuse yourself. And we can amuse ourselves by animating the direction. Excellent. Okay. And let's quit subobject mode. And let's have a look at my animation that I just made just by changing the direction of my skew. Wow, dancing teapots. Haven't seen those for a while. Let's have a look at the modifier slice now. Slice simply allows you to cut. So modifiers, parametric deformers, slice. Okay, slice, as you can see, there's a plane. And as we, what's it good for? So if I turn on my wireframes, then I can see that slice is showing me extra edges where it's cutting. But just in case you forgot to put a segment in somewhere and you don't want to subdivide further or go back into poly tools. But exactly the same thing as slice as we've seen in the polygon utilities, but it's non-destructive. If you hit refine mesh, you'll just add an edge. If you hit split mesh, you'll cut the two parts of the mesh apart completely. If you use remove top or remove bottom, then what you're doing is deleting the top or the bottom of your object everything below the plane or everything above the plane. So not only can you cut, but also you can actually reveal your form, your object. Like this, you can make some pretty interesting things. So let's do remove top and let's just move my uh, plane up, 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 all the way up to the top. Okay, there we go. There it is, at the top of my head. One nice thing about the slice plane is that it's infinitely large, so it doesn't actually have to be over your object. 
Because it's in the objects modifier stack. It's going to just affect that one object. That's what it allows me. Let's turn off wireframes. This allows me to see um, what's inside the person, what's inside his brain. As you can see, either he's worked too much with 3D Studio Max or he's British. Slice allows you to just slice an object. For you to animate to make the effects you want. And also here, go and have a look at the course support that talks about animation with 3D Studio Max 2010 as well. Slice with other modifiers. Okay, the slice, as we saw, we can just see his thoughts and we can rotate it as well, so we can reveal in different order. Okay, but it's always open at the bottom. If you want to actually close that hole, then let's move down a bit. If I want to close that hole automatically, I can use another modifier, which is in Medish Editing, where we've got cap holes. It's exactly the same thing as if you're in the Edit Poly tool and you go to Border and then you do right mouse button and you can choose Cap. So there you go, you've got a, an automatic closing. Because it's over the top of Slice, you can move the Slice still and the Cap will follow. If you want to rotate it around, the cap will still follow. Right. If you're satisfied with this cut, for example, you could always just right mouse button convert to poly. But at that point, you've now got a polygonal mesh. You lost all your modifiers uh, and uh, above all, the vision of the thoughts. When you convert to poly, it keeps the same pivot point from your original shape and of course you can put it in a different way so you can either use the edit transform toolbox or you can just go in hierarchies effect pivot center to object align to object and so on and so forth and move it around manually of course there's different choices so we can go back to toolbox that we can actually align the pivot here so z on the minimum so at the bottom of the object to the top of the object, I'll put it on minimum and put it on Z. Here's the character I modeled before, and this character doesn't have any thickness. I just worked on a membrane, and uh, the fact that I edited and all the rest of it, it didn't have any thickness. So you can give a thickness to objects with modifier parametric deformance shell, and this gives you a thickness either from the inside to the outside or from the outside to the inside towards the inside uh, here it's probably better to go towards the inside than go towards the outside where we fatten the details it's an offset that's the offset is based on going in the opposite direction to the normals of the existing polygons okay and several places you need to be careful about junctions like this you can actually add in the previous modifier that we saw slice and remove top and now you'll see that our shell gives our slice a cap so now I can modify my slice plane and all the time my skin has a thickness, so now convert to editable poly, and there's a model made. So there you go, uh, one of the approaches you can use shell for, uh, which allows you to give a thickness to an object. What's interesting is that normally when we do a cloth simulation, we do it without a thickness, and then we add this shell afterwards. Going further with shell. Okay, so now let me make a line in the front view. Okay, there you go. And what's interesting now is I'm going to make an extra line, a second line. 
So I made it in this sense, and now I'm doing exactly the same sense, so from the top to the bottom. I'm going to take this line, I'm going to use a modifier that we already know, uh, lathe, minimum, and weld core fit normal. Okay. Okay, my object hasn't got any thickness, so we could have done an outline, but here we want to see shell. So parameter deformers, shell, and there we go. Now we've got thickness without any worries. I could add some segments on the top edge here. So there you go. One segment, for example. But I could also use bevel edges. And I pick the spline. There we go. And now I can see the bevel on my glass. If you made your second line very well, then there's no worries. So if you can add more segments, but it doesn't actually make any difference because now that spline generates the bevel. So if I take that line and change the components in it, so if I use fillet for example, so I can add some extra detail there and I can see immediately on my glass object, I can see that it's rounded. It's an instance, so obviously if you wish to delete the uh, interpolation, you can cut it down. But because there are so, so many segments, we can't really see very well. So, this is how to use it. It doesn't actually make any difference if you rotate it or move it. Instances are made according to the sub-object, so if your orientation isn't right, then take the spline as a sub-object and turn it. But obviously, you could have things that really are special. Uh, it's actually best to think about it when you start, when you create it, so you make it in the same order as the original line. As we can see, we made the line from the top to the bottom in a nice curve, and then create the bevel line in the same sense. Automatically, it will adapt to your shape. If I come back to bevel, I can see down here, selecting edges. I can select interior faces, select outer faces. I can straighten the corners as well, so that I can modify or uh, m make easier selections. I can change the material IDs depending on the faces I do. And now we're coming back to material ideas like we showed you in the material editor. It's exactly the same process. Let's go a bit further with Shell now. You remember our little P-man that we made with the uh, editable poly tools? Uh, let's Turn, turn off subdivision uh, eventually and now let's have a look at these polygons let's hit F4 so we can see let's get these ones hold down control to select more than one okay all right now I'm right mouse button W uh, right mouse button and move or W on the keyboard hold down shift to copy clone to object mask okay right now the polygon I can put it back on smoothing okay let me take this object which is always a poly object I'm going to put the modifier parametric deformers shell there you go and now I've got a thickness uh, either towards the exterior or towards the interior okay this is a poly object, so it should have kept the subdivision. So there you go. If I go back to shell, then you lose the subdivision. Okay, let me change its color so we can understand better. We'll make it black. Okay. Like that. You can use objects by copying bits from other objects and using shell to give them a thickness. P-Man! This allows you to take profiles from objects. Uh, examples are, are obvious, so like on vases or other things, so like the other image that we showed you earlier. Uh, there you go. Uh, you can see this, this handle with the 
anything that carries on, okay, nothing stops you from going back into poly mode and continuing the modeling of this geometry. So all you have to do is create faces or extruding faces. So it's up to you to continue to, to work. And now if you go into shell, if you want to go on to the thickness in the shell and keep the shell as it was, uh, then you need to add edit poly modify and then you can select the polygons that are on the thickness of the shell so on both sides and extrude change the scale uh, center of the selection and there we go There you are. The relax modifier. Okay, so we're going to use this on the bust again. Let's get closer to the bust, and if we get too close, we can see distortions because of the perspective. So let's change our field of view. So configure. Okay, change that from 45 to 20, and okay. Now we won't have any distortions. Okay, or fewer anyway. Let me use parametric relax. Relax uses certain forces to soften objects. You can take it to the extreme like so. Yeah, okay. It relaxes tensions, which allows you to soften or rejuvenate an object at particular points. Okay, rather than doing it on the whole object, perhaps we should do it on individual vertices vertices obviously we can use soft selection but is there another way of using getting our vertices of course we could paint our soft selection or paint directly onto our selection so I'm in vertex mode and I can mm, I can paint my vertices for if I hit Q to make sure I'm in mode selection and then I can paint there we go. And now I look at the relax and I can see that my painting worked on the relax. So you can see I paint some more relaxing. Okay, there we go. Now I can localize my facelift. Before, after, before, after, before, after. So you can see the softening of the eyes. Obviously, I could have done this relax directly in the editable poly, but this allows you to do a, a relax on another type of object or even to animate the relaxing. You can easily animate relax by adding key values to these iterations and relax values and easily adjusted for the zone that I already chose in my modifier stack. Let's have a look a little bit at the relax options. Okay, so there's my object. It's a poly object, and I'm going to add on top of it a parametric deformer, relax. Relax, I can zip it up a bit, and we can see, uh, I think I have exaggerated here, we can still see that some points stay in place. The explanation is pretty simple. It's the most extreme points. So this one, this one, here, here, and here. All these points have been stayed in the same place. They haven't been relaxed. They haven't gone into the center of the geometry. All it is is down to this option, keep boundary points fixed. If I untick this box, and now you can see that the form squishes down completely. Okay, so I've got another one here, save outer corners, which uh, here it's easier to see if I see the wireframes. Now I can do relax and it only relaxes interior segments to our creature. It keeps all the outside edge. Let me turn off all that and just up my uh, iterations a bit. Let me add a subdivision modifier, Turbo Smooth. Okay, and now I can come back to Editable Poly. Let me show all the transformation. And now I'll hide all the wireframes. If I now use soft selection, I will see that if I select all these points up here, all these ones, 
they will just take all of the modifier stack. In this case, let me just paint the areas that I'm interested in, in seeing relaxed. So the base of the antennas, uh, to modify the size of the brush, control shift, shift and alt to change the force. So control shift to change the size and shift alt to change the force, the strength. Okay. Let me check these points here. And the antennae here. Okay, and that allows me to paint the bits that interest me the most. I can revert to undo certain zones which were selected. So change the size of the brush so I can go a bit bigger in some zones and like that we can locally relax certain places on your object to correct your modeling okay here the neck and the antennae the preserve modifier can be pretty interesting uh, when you want to keep the topology of your original geometry let's have a look Here's my geometry. Uh, hit F4 to see the distribution of points. Okay, so let me take this one and duplicate it with Shift with a copy. Now, we'll see instantly what I mean. Okay, so let's take the points here. Let's just take some of them and just lift them up. The fact that I've just lifted them up, I've lost my distribution of points how the points are arranged to make my form. All I've done is take the points and just lift them up. Uh, you can add a modifier preserve. At this point it should be above, at the top of the stack. If I pick original, click on there and there you go. What it will try and do is redistribute all the points to keep the same distribution of points that allows you and it allows you to change the number of iterations to try and get closer to what you'll look like so you can apply it to the whole object or just the selected vertices and as you can see it will do it according to the last vertex selected you can use soft selection to change the rest of the geometry and all the same it's always the same principle you can invert the selection and so on and so forth. There you go. So preserve allows you to keep the same kind of topology for an object. Okay, so here I've got lots of edges and preserve will try to give a similar distribution. So there's the distance of the modification, just lifting those points up. And so there you go, preserve. Be careful, this modifier has to be above the whole stack. You can obviously stack several modifiers. Okay, push does exactly what it says. So let me put push on this object. There we go. And now I just lift up the value. And there we go. Oh, so he's got a, some kind of energy. Okay, so now let's change this and we'll make a boxer. So if I come back to edit poly, I can select by vertices and let me show end result then I can see by the, z the zone I've selected it works so let's uh, deselect those and soft section is on so let me just use paint oh that's a bit big so control shift to change the size and now I just paint over my object in soft selection so you can see it's come back from the ring I'm not sure if he won or not and there we go, a few more clicks, and that's where I click, that's push. There we go. There's no problem here, because the advantage here is that if you put push to zero, there's nothing there. If you put it negative, then it's go oh, ugly. Okay, let me put it at zero. Okay, and animate it. And there we go. The blowing up of the person very simply 
There you go, push. In our list of modifiers, and I'll make a teapot here just so that we can see our list properly. Modifiers, parametric deformers, we can see them here. Uh, we've got push. And then we've got physique. Physique is a skin system that was developed at the time of the Character Studio plugin. The system better known today under the name Biped. It's above all for animation, but let's say it's showing its age a bit and it hasn't been updated for a very long time. So we'll leave it for now. Let's go on to noise. Noise is to give a disturbance to objects in a random fashion. If I put noise on the teapot, it's going to be a bit odd. Uh, let's just do X and let's put the force to 100. Okay. Now let's change the scale. Drop it down. And you could start seeing it. And there you go. How does this work when I've re reduced this scale? So. It's as though I had an FFD that was subdivided into lots of little bits. And on the x-axis, I'm moving all the points in a random fashion. I repeat, every time I put a spatial deformer on an object, then it's a kind of FFD, a freeform deformer, but they're parametric, obviously. Uh, the FFD in this case, called noise, is um, putting noise on this x-axis that we can see down here always as a witness it works on a scale based on this zone okay we can change the seed which is the random seed we can change the scale back down to a, a bit more normal there you go 10 10 times less and we can change the x we can change the y and we can change the z obviously so I used it once to make a kind of slice of marble that was ordered, so I made a box, uh, stretched it up, uh, I did a lot of subdivisions, uh, I'd look at them by pressing F4, and and it was subdivided a lot on the height and a little bit there. Okay, uh, let's turn off wireframes, and now let's put noise on. And here's the noise. Okay, I'll reduce its scale. And I shall just change the X, uh, the Y and the X. And I won't touch Z at all. Otherwise I'll get waviness. So I'll put that to zero. So with Fractal, that gives you a little bit more kind of uh, variation. Uh, you have to be careful, otherwise you might get artifacts. Okay, so there we go. And now I had uh, my kind of broken piece of marble as it was shewn straight out of the rock. Okay, so we under start to understand now. Let's make a copy and just change that a bit. Take off fractal, uh, move it over here and roll it over. There we go, stone tablets. All right, the noise is sometimes used for rapidly making rounds or waves. So now I'm going to make a plane. I'll subdivide it by 20 by 20 and I'll add uh, parametric deformers noise and here I'm just going to use the Z. Okay. Alright, let's change the scale and let's drop down the strength on Z and now you can animate it. If you just tick that, automatically, it's automatically auto animated. We can change the frequencies for those who are easily seasick and slow them down again to just calm you down. Let's just slow them down a little bit and change the Z scale. And there you go. Very simple with noise. Of course, in noise, you also have the center, which you can move around, and its gizmo, which is the top level. Obviously, this is animatable as well, so you can animate in Z, and now you can do a little movement, like so, and play. The lattice. 
The lattice is going to transform the edges of your objects into tubes. Let's have a look. Turmetric deformers, lattice. Uh, uh, I think we need to scale down a little bit. Uh, let's go that here. And segments, let's reduce those down. Okay, two, that's fine. Okay, lattice. Uh, we can see the joints. Uh, we can remove the joints, just the struts. Okay, we can change the size uh, and the number of segments for each strut, we can see there. Uh, and the number of sides for each strut. And you can make them smooth for light. End caps is for welding and automatically closing each cylinder. Okay, All right. sides is the number of sides, obviously. Okay, let's form this down a little bit, and there we go, our lattice. Uh, but I use this an awful lot to to do various things. So we can use this as a cage for for a sphere, sphere in a teapot. There you go. To make a system of cages, it's very handy. So I've already used it for different types of image. Uh, an example. If I reset this, I'll show you the sphere. I'll use the hemisphere function to cut it in half. And I'll cut down the number of segments. And now what I'm going to do is copy my sphere. I'll convert it into poly first. So use move and uh, move and just shift over. OK. This allows me to use uh, the lattice deformer on this sphere. Let's take off. Uh, we only want the struts. Let's cut them down a bit. And now I can put the other one. Oh, let's change the color so we can see it better. Let's put the other one straight in the same place. Uh, like this, we've got a kind of uh, windowed dome, if you like. OK, so I'll show you a little bit more. Now if you choose from your editable poly stack, you can take Vertex and you can take the very top one and you can see all of it. And then if you champ for this point, and there you go, you get a nice ring. Do the same for down below. Very nice. Now I'll duplicate this object, clone. That's a copy. The clone is the same place. I'm just changing the color, okay, and I'll take off lattice. And now I've got a clone exactly in the same place. Now this I've already used for the old uh, bomber planes that have got a window like this at the bottom with machine guns. And now this object is made of faces, so I can delete that polygon. I can take the one behind, I can delete that as well, and now I've directly got my bomber turret. OK, so as you can see, it's rapid and it's pretty practical. In modifiers, the parametric deformer displace reacts a bit like the uh, poly displacement. But poly displacement that we saw when we looked at polygons uh, is subdivided at render time. Here, displacement has to be subdivided right away. So let's have a look now. We'll make a plane, and by default, a plane is 4x4. Four four. Now I'll add our deformer in parametric deformers, displace. And now here, we can actually load an image here. we we'll go into Windows. You could also reduce your 3D Studio Max Windows size and just take an image like this, and just drag and drop it. This is just a simple JPEG. I mean, my 3D studio, I can see my images there. Now I can change the strength up or down. Obviously, now I've hit F4, uh, this isn't a great subdivision. It needs more. If I come back to my plane and I change it to 50 by 50, then at least I can see my letters. If I go back to this place, I can also 
come down here, image, I can add a blur. Okay. Let me reduce my strength a bit. And there we go. Uh, above plane, I can add another modifier, a mesh editing edit poly. Now, if I take that and take a, a point, and I can see that that point is actually pushed up. It's pushed up because where edit poly is in the stack means that displace will work on my selection. Okay, if I go on this principle, if I take the central point, if I use soft selection and now enlarge my radius, there you go, I can reveal my letters. Okay, very simply. Let's just take off edit poly and let's come back to uh, displace. Let me take off the, the blur. And now rather than using this bitmap image, this JPEG here, yeah, that was not by default, that's what we actually just loaded, so it changes to that. But you could put whatever you like, including animations, obviously. So if you're not sure of which format you need, just choose all formats and you can even uh, go and find an animation. If I do open, now I can see my animation which is pushing my plane. It's a here is a, a video that's actually pushing the plane up and down. We could uh, stop at any point, um, like that's that's all right, that's not bad, and then just convert to editable poly, and there you go, you've now got an object. Okay, this is the first part of displace. So let's continue with displace and just a simple plane. There you go. Let's up the segmentation, so 50 by 50. Let me maximize the perspective view. Now go into modifiers, parametric, displace. I'm not going to use an image, but now a map. What's a map? A map is different things that uh, offered by 3D Studio Max, including images, but other systems that are fractal or even more complex. Uh, it's best for you to, if you want to have a deeper look at this, it's best for you to go to the Lighting Material Texturing DVD. Let's, we can look on noise. We've already seen this, and now we can see the noise is going to dis influence the displacement of the object. M for materials. And this is Material Editor. We, all the materials in 3D Studio Max are edited here. So I can drag and drop here. And I'll just choose Instance. Okay, here. If I change the size, it changes the size in the viewport. If I change the concentration on blacks, Displace always works in the same fashion uh, as we did in polygonal objects, where it's black, there's zero Displace no strength. Where you've got white bits, the strength is equal to this value here. And obviously, the based on the intensity of, of the amount of white in the gray, you diminish the amount of strength involved. Okay, so we can put in fractal, which will give us a little bit harder peaks and change the peaks and change the space like that. Right now, I'm going to show you a little tip. I'm not going to use the noise now. Let's remove map. And there's nothing. Okay, so it's all the object that's pushed up and down. Let's leave it at roughly 60 centimeters. Map, and now this time I'll use a gradient. And now we can see more clearly that obviously the blacks are down here the greys and the whites at the top. To edit it, so M for material editor, drag and drop, instance, okay. There's my gradient. If I make a radial gradient, I can see with my white dot in the center of the plane, that's the high point, and the black points are around the outside edges. If I put the black into the middle one here, copy, now I've got black, black, and then white, and that shows you in the viewport. 
instead of this white swatch here, I just put an image or a video. Well, that bit will be influenced by the grayscale levels of those bits. So I could actually use my noise texture. So here I can change the scale, uh, put it on fractal and change the low and high points. To navigate in materials, it's not too complicated. You just go up here or you can just go, go to parent. Here the parent is our gradient. Now, this one, second local number two, I'll take the noise and I'll just drag it across. And this time I'll just do a copy. Okay, now I've got a second noise. Okay, click on it to manipulate and I'll change the division between blacks and whites and above all its scale. Okay, like this, I can see uh, there's a kind of a mountain range that's young in the middle and older around the outside edges because the the hills are a bit sort of softer and then we can see in my thumbnail we can see what we've got in the viewport obviously you can always add another modifier turbo smooth let's say and more render time than in the viewport so in the render then you can see there's a little bit more smoothness a little bit more like the thumbnail okay I can uh, modify several things so I can change the the threshold I can change the size okay and obviously I can animate uh, the pushing up of mountains the growth of mountains okay so we can see the principle a lot better if I reduce to zero if I go to parent and choose my other noise the central noise and I'll do the same I'll make the strength a little bit smaller or the size a bit smaller rather and now all I need to do is animate the forces the thresholds so let me put myself here, Auto key, and now change my values here, go to Parent, go on the other noise texture, change there as well, and there we go, change the size a bit, okay, now I'll quit Material key Editor, take off auto key and now I've animated my mountain range growing the displace examples we saw before all used images so fractals or noise or, or whatever uh, animated or not which allows you for instance to make a an apple use an image in displacement and show it's rotting or you could make a, a heart for instance and you could use a grayscale image to animate uh, the uh, beatings of the heart but always we've used a, a grayscale image is it possible to use something else to drive our displacement other than just a grayscale image I made a tube here and let's have a look I'm going to use the parametric deformer modifier displace and we can see that it's a plane to start off with and it's on here that the image is projected if I wanted to put cylindrical and then you can see that the image will be projected around the cylinder and this is the texture coordinates here it's displacement it's how the uh, grayscale image will be projected if I do spherical I have a sphere if now I change the strength you can see the displacement is based around the sphere the decay is basically the attenuation so that it's not done on, on all the geometry and because uh, displace inherits the tubes settings we can add a number of segments here uh, so that we can refine our deformation now like this I can go back to displace I can change the strength and the decay and show how it works on the geometry I've got.
This place has always got a gizmo, obviously, that I can move as I like to show the passage of something in a digestive system, for instance. So this is what uh, the different types of mapping coordinates are used for. Okay, you can always, uh, we'll look at this later on, you can always use mapping coordinates that exist already. But to understand this, obviously I'm going to send you to the DVD on materials, textures and UV mapping. Automatic distribution and duplication in a scene is very handy when you want to distribute uh, several objects that are relatively identical in a scene. Let's do an example. So let's make two cylinders. There we go. And copy it over here. And now we'll make a box over here. Like that. Between the two cylinders, let's make a line just a straight line for the moment uh, but let me change the vertices on it into bezier corner ones which allow me to give it a bit of a, a downward slope okay uh, let's change out of sub object mode and let's move the line a little bit into the center of the cylinders okay this is all we need uh, now for what's going to follow well, now I've got three objects that aren't unified, so let's make a simple box again, auto grid, on top of the cylinder. Right, there we go. There's the box that I got made. Now I'm going to make distributed copies of that box along that line. So we'll go into the tools menu, align. Um, here we can see align, traditional, and quick align. Align is just that icon up there, and quick align is the one in the group spacing tool. Spacing tool is going to allow you to pick a path and now you can distribute uh, three by default but I can put as many as I like. Distribution is made a bit like stairs so obviously you can follow the line and so now it's becoming a lot nicer we can change the start offset which allows you to concentrate all your objects back towards the end and and the end offset does the opposite obviously there we go okay well, we've got different options here uh, obviously you've got a choice to test because obviously it's going to be different for different kinds of shapes that you make. So there's a way to quickly distribute objects, so like for cat whiskers or collars or like this bridge for instance. Don't forget to do apply, otherwise you might have to do it all again. This blank, the original one, I don't need it anymore, I'll just delete it. There you are, a way to quickly distribute objects in a scene. The Align function spacing tools allows you to use either lines or points. Points are objects we haven't seen yet, so 3D, 2D, lights, cameras, helpers, and here we've got points. So points are objects that aren't seen at render time and allow you to have sort of guides in the scene or to use as intermediate objects. So here's a point. Let's make a sphere and we'll choose this primitive object is the child of the point. The advantage is that now I can just rotate the point and rotate the sphere and the point won't be seen in the render time. These are just helper objects that act as intermediaries. These objects can have some interesting parameters. So let's turn off of the grid. Okay, so here are the parameters. So sit in a box says across or not uh, access tripod so now you can see how you're turning your object so center marker so if you don't want to see anything else you just want to see the box so you can see where the center is so you can add these things together as a personal choice the size and it's better to do that than changing the scale because otherwise you might mess up hierarchies You've got constant screen size, so uh, if you zoom in or out, it doesn't change its size on the screen. It, 
if you turn off that option, then as you zoom in and zoom out, it will shrink and grow as the same as the other objects. Draw on top allows you to always see the pointer, the point, even if it's behind an object. The advantage is if it's inside an object. This uh, little theory on point objects is done now, so let's reset. Uh, it's pretty simple anyway. So we'll just go back to helpers. We'll create some points. One. Let's turn off box and just leave access tripod and another one there and another one there. Let's turn this one and that one as well. Um, just any old hell. Okay, now I'll make a teapot. And I'll maximize the view. So now I've got a teapot and three point objects. The teapot is selected, so tools, align, spacing tool. Uh, so count, and by default it's three, so let's put it just, just out of one. Pick point, and click on the point here. And there we go, we've got a teapot, and it's aligned. It's positioned directly on the point, uh, so if we put two for the count, we can we need to change the spacing so that they're not one on top of the other. There we go. And it's based on the orientation of the point. If you do follow, then it will change to follow where the point is pointing, if you like. The rest is all the same, as usual. If you turn, you need to do pick point again to reactivate your another point, perhaps. So there we go. Now we can see it's following the orientation of the point. So we're just doing a count of one. So now there's no spacing edges. Doesn't really interest us here and center, that's better. Copy instance or reference, obviously. Which allows you to distribute objects based on points. Obviously, spacing tool is a lot more useful with a line and so more often used that way. In our automatic distribution duplication segment, we've got another one that's very useful, which is clone and align. This will allow you to take an object, like this one uh, that came in via Merge, and put it onto other objects. So Tools, Align, Clone and Align. Okay, you turn off Licked and Destination for the moment. Pick, and then tick on the objects we want to align on. So now we can directly place the objects and adjust their positions. Uh, if you want to click link to destination, when you move a destination object, the teapot will be locked to it. Obviously you can change the angle or position. So we can do copies, instances or references. Apply. If I quit that menu, I can now delete my original teapot and the link function has allowed me to attach the uh, teapot directly to the target object. So that you can understand link parameters better, go and see the DVD on 3D Studio Max Animation. This is a, an easy technique, very useful, uh, clone and align, which will allow you to place one object on another object, or in a more complex scene. Align to view. It's here, Tools menu, Align, whoop, Align to view. Normal Align we've seen, Align camera we haven't seen yet, Place highlight we haven't either. Align to view is basically here, down at the bottom of the list. The principle is pretty simple, and it's to place an object according to your view of it. So, to show you, so let's see where I'm looking in my perspective view and I'm looking at the object like this. The object is going to align to my view. Align to view, that's what it means. So align Z and you can flip it one way or the other. So what is the Z of the object? Just to show you, my object is modeled from the bottom to the top, so that's the base, that's the X and Y, and that's the Z. So it's completely logical that it's Z is oriented towards the opposite of what I'm looking at, so it's inverted. So if I untick flip, I'm looking at the top. I'm going to align 
x, y, and invert it like that. So this function allows you to feel a little bit looked at by your teapot. So what can we do with what we've learned? If we look at this, we can see this scene here. These objects, they look at quite complicated, but they're not really. Here, we can see there's a profile. And it goes around an axis like this. So that's a fundamental. So we could make it into a poly, obviously, to extrude this bit. Then there's a line. And extruded, or maybe it's a loft, or maybe it's just a thickness. Now we've got different profiles down here. And here we've got a spring, which is, again, just a line made renderable. So we've got different shapes here, lots of lathes. Uh, oh, there's an FFD there. There's a plane with a subdivision with a bit of noise in displacement. And this will give us the, a, an overview of modeling. And then if we look at a scene, then always look at the modeling that's gone into it. Now, if we look around and see what it can give us in terms of render. So, and this is the inventory in which I shall take you. We're here, we're going here in, and then there to obtain a final render that looks like this. So when I look at the modeling, it's not all that complicated. It just uses the tools that we saw in from fundamentals and in the basics of modeling. Here's another example, which might at the moment seem out of your reach, really. But really, if we just uh, take away all the lights and the materials and everything, and obviously we'll go on to those bits in the next part of our training, if we just look at the modeling, and if we just analyze the modeling of this scene, which is completely 3D, by the way, if we zoom in a bit, the most important thing is just to avoid some triangulations and points that are badly placed. If we have a look, it's just here, the same thing as always, a profile, uh, several little reinforcements here with a edit poly maybe. Uh, so here a profile which is then extruded with a loft. Again a lathe, or lathes there. Here we can see that we can make a plane and give it an extrusion, make it a poly and put a hole in the middle. So the result is that the scene that we see here should appear far easier to create for you in terms of modeling than at the start of this training. Okay, Max has several different m mirroring options or symmetries. So let me show you this mesh a little bit to show you it's not very complicated, especially it's the character you give an object that's more important. So let's go and have a look into mirror and obviously I'll give you a few tips along the way as is my habit. So what can mirror be used for? Heads are normally quite symmetrical, so if I just make half a head and then add mirror functions, uh, obviously you've got mirror up here for the whole part of the object, so options, so choice of axes, X was the mess, best one there, copy or an instance. If you do a copy, then there's no problem, but if you do an instance, then when you uh, modify one half, the other half will be modified. Offset allows you to, to change the offset, obviously. Uh, so we'll keep it on zero. Hit OK. The pivot point is here, so let's modify it a bit. Let's center it in the object. And put it there in the middle. OK. Now, let's go back a little bit. Let's go the fact that we're in mirror function it allows me to select some vertices on one side and they change on the other side if I'm in instance mode. Let's change. Uh, we'll show you soft selection thing. If you go into soft selection, you could actually end up taking some of the, the hair there, which you don't really want to do, because the soft selection is based on a radius around your point of selection, a, s a spherical. Uh, zone of influence. So I could obviously here I could select some of the hair. So I don't want to do that. So if you tick edge distance instead, you can tick the number of edges that the soft selection will cross. 
So like that, you can actually just say you want a soft section just for the ears and not influencing the hair or the skull at all. Just a little extra bit, why not? Right, so let's delete this object. And now I can see that I have another mirror function. So if I go into modifiers, parametric deformers, mirror. So why have I got this mirror as well with the same options, uh, with the same offset and all the rest of it? Well, because here the mirror is not done on the whole object, but just as a modifier. So then it inherits your selection. So if I just selection this polygons here and I just show the whole pile, then I can see that the mirror is only based on my selection which is quite cool if you want to make a mask for instance or something similar okay let's delete this function okay I'll come out of sub object mode and uh, now uh, if I go into modifiers again mesh editing symmetry I've got one here so it's a little bit different it's a bit like mirror but it's a bit different so Again, there's a sub-object mirror, which is symbolized by this plane here, which is this, which will give you the choice of axis that you choose for your mirror, for your flip functions as well. You can uh, separate the objects by moving the plane. But what is interesting is the fact that when you go in, it welds automatically. We can perhaps, when we see a flip, there you go, it's a choice. If the distance is too big uh, for your threshold, you can't do the welding. So you could up the threshold and then you can do the welding. But be careful that you don't up the threshold too much, otherwise more points will get welded together. So it's good for correcting little errors in symmetry. Okay. Okay, let's turn off wireframes and convert to poly and you can see a symmetry that's done but it's very rare that objects are really symmetrical especially uh, anatomical objects like a face so now it's up to you to use soft selection uh, to modify the points uh, in uh, use paint mode for instance to move the details around to remove the symmetry so paint allows you to just you can choose the selected part uh, remember painting any kind of selection you need to hit Q and then W to move those bits around Q to paint W to move your selection okay let's move that up, up a bit or down a little bit more natural Q to paint and W to move okay make sure you make sure that you're in paint mode here okay Let's drop that side of his face a bit as well okay there we go. Right, from now you can see that there are some more subdivisions with Turbo Smooth or just in the bodies. And put Nerms, for instance. So we've got a, a bit of a smoother form. Now, the symmetry has got a really annoying thing which it makes a seam up the middle sometimes. So if you go back to Edge Mode and turn off Soft Selection and you turn off NERMS and you can see automatically it selected that edge in the middle which allows you to modify its tension with a relax for instance or a change in scale so there you are for symmetry and mirror the little extras okay so what are they Okay, these modifiers, mesh editing, and we can see, we've seen cat holes, and then we've got others down here, which can be used with other things. So with selection mode, for instance, you can see that there are lots of different components there. So 
to show how delete mesh works, let's make a teapot. I'll convert it into editable poly. And now use the points. I'll take these vertices and I'll um, put mesh editing delete mesh. Okay. So there we go. It's they're deleted, those points. So I could actually do them in another way, couldn't I? Uh, well, it's true, but it's the combination with other things that could be groovy. So let's reset and take the front view, maximize it, take off the grid. Let's make a plane and subdivide it a lot. Okay. Right, on this plane, I'm going to put a selection modifier, volume select. To go a bit further with volume select, go and have a look at the animation DVD because it's used a lot and there are a lot of hints and tips. But all we're going to do with this is now what we can do in modeling. So volume select, now I can actually choose my selection level. I can take objects, I can take vertices, or I can take faces. So I'll take vertex. If I can select, I can also select by an object or even by a texture. So if I reduce 3D Studio Max, I can see my windows behind and I can just drag and drop. Uh, so I can show the texture map bit here, activate it and drag and drop an image onto my none button. It's a grayscale image. So now where the white is, the points are going to be selected. OK, so now if I put on another modifier, delete mesh, I'm destroying the mesh at that point. Okay, so now I'll go into perspective mode, perspective view. I'll show my smoothing and, and highlights and add thickness to it, so a shell deformer. There we go. There's the shell. And now we can see that because of the subdivision of the plane or the pixelization of the image, uh, we can see different results. If I add a turbo smooth, so like that, then I get a smoothing. Don't forget that everything that's materials, textures or whatever, uh, that use a volume select, we can go in the material editor, so we can hit M on the keyboard to get it. So here we are. We've got two techniques. So we can either drag and drop onto our thumbnail or just uh, go and find the material in the scene by clicking here. Okay, since we've, we're have we going to do materials training later on, all we're going to do is what we know already, so just drag and drop. So instance, okay. This material is the one used for cutting out the letters. We could add a blur to the image and we'll see that the areas that are cut out change. We could have put a video or an image sequence, so unlike that we could have seen two or three little things, so like a sign that's getting progressively weathered or other systems like rust, for instance, that attacks an object, whatever you like, it's pretty simple to model. and. The, th the blur can be done in Max, or it could be done in Photoshop, or your preferred image editor. We're now going to look at a modifier that could save your life if your modelling wasn't done correctly. The modifier is no called Normal. Uh, I already looked at Normals a lot in Fundamentals, so here's the teapot, and our teapot is a mesh. We know that now, and this mesh is made of polygons, points and edges, segments, and the orientation of the faces is called a normal. There's my observer who looks at the teapot, and there's a light, which is lighting the scene, and the light sends a, a beam to the object which returns to the observer. The light bounces back in the direction that the normal indicates, so if each face is correctly modelled, then the light will bounce off in a correct fashion. Let's imagine that one of the mirrored faces uh, of this faceted teapot is lightly sloped towards the outside. For my observer, 
the result is going to be visible straight away because of the light. Uh, the light is going to hit correctly on all these faces here around, but here, and, and here you will see them all bouncing back to the eye, but here will look darker because the light is going to be bounced off in a different direction. A bit like a kid playing with a little mirror in the trees. Okay, the observer, if he moves, or another observer looks over here, he will see the, the, uh, this face, but it will be much brighter than all the others. So there you go. Now we'll have a look at how it works. So let's see, mesh editing, edit normals. And we can see the handles to manipulate them. And let's take a single one here and we'll rotate it and we'll change its orientation. And I can see that this face has become a bit darker. The uh, smoothing cannot can no longer be done correctly. So if I come over here, then I can see that it's a lot brighter. It's not a problem. If there's a problem here with a black dot, then all you hit is unify and you will unify all the normals. Unifying cures all problems. There's another modifier in the modifiers menu, mesh editing, called normal modifier. Edit normals is to actually edit them singly. This is just the simplest way of doing it. So you can unify normals or you can flip them. That's all. So in case there's any problems, you can always test this one. That will stop you from having to go into all the individual normals. Mesh optimization. 3D Studio Max actually offers several mesh optimization methods. Personally, I'm not really for them because I think the best is to actually think about what you're going to do, what you need before you start modeling. But, but if you're faced with a mesh that's a bit messy, it gives you, gives you some tools to use for cleaning. Well, let's have a look at the wireframes and now we can see what kind of cleaning we can do. Modifiers, mesh editing, and we'll choose multi-res. Multi-res works on a percentage or a number of points, your vertices in your object. I can put my crease angle here and hit generate. Now I can change my settings. So I'm at 100% of the points and I can see that my object is 4,979 points. So I can drop that down and the result isn't very pretty. Uh, or I can change the percent if I want, but that's not great. It can make you a bit sad. One of the optimizations there. Now, the other techniques are a bit different. Uh, so, mesh editing, and we'll go down to optimize now. This one allows you to change the thresholds there, and you can choose the polygons, the edges, and you can make biases to change the area that you want to adjust and it depends on your topology and the kind of object you need so level one level two for the renderer and the viewports and you can see down here before and after counts when you have organic forms uh, like this uh, with lots of angle changes like this it, it it can work okay so if you have a cylinder with lots of segments in the height there you could actually use the uh, optimize modifier on it and you'll see that all the segments in the height have gone. Uh, when you've got simple hard uh, geometry it works quite well uh, but when you're using it on characters uh, it can be a bit depressing after all. Uh, just make sure you model correctly so you don't have to use it. For hard modeled objects no problem. So Knowing the problems that the previous optimization tools could give, uh, Autodesk gave us in Max 2010 a brilliant advance. So now what I'm going to do is go to wireframe mode here and choose one of the new modifiers in Max 2.10, Pro Optimizer. Pro Optimizer allows you to see your mesh, then hit calculate, and then you can change the vertices down, the percentage, and you can see it's a lot nicer than previous ones. It doesn't destroy as much either. Okay, you can also instead choose to drop down the vertex counts. And here you can see that 
around the edges all the detail is kept so if you do crunch borders then you've got to recalculate and it might destroy your borders at the same time you can do keep textures keep torrentures uh, there's lots of features in there and it's always uh, trying to protect your original object so make sure you do protect borders calculate and then afterwards modify don't look in wireframe mode this is just so I could show you work in smooth mode and wireframe if you want to or just in smooth so you can actually see what it's going to do to your object once again it's better with hard body models things that are manufactured uh, or man-made so we'll leave this a bit to one side but you can see that this one's a lot better than the other two. This is one of the new things in 2.10. While we're looking at new things in 3D Studio Max 2010, let's have a look at one that allows you to automatically subdivide your volumes. So I made a bit of text here with a, a really good URL and so I'm going to add extrusion to it. So when I add an extrusion so I can add some segments in the depth so you can see but I, what I can't do is put them on the face of the text, which means that if I add a turbo smooth, for instance, it's a horribleness for the faces. Okay, we can, we're sorted now. So we'll get rid of the segments, and it's uh, sorted with a modifier called Mesh Editing Quadify, Quadify Mesh, which automatically subdivides your objects. Uh, so it's uh, this one that's going to determine subdivision. So we're just going to extrude. There's no point in putting adding some segments because they will have no influence. Let's we'll go back to qualify. Up in your quad size here won't make any difference because you're going to make uh, quads that are so big you won't see them at all. But lowering them, be really careful. Okay, three, two. But don't ever go underneath one unless it's really necessary because at that point, quadding is going to be so small that you're going to have problems with your processor or calculation times or even a, a crash of your system. Okay, what I'll do is take off subdivision now and just add on my Turbo Smooth. And uh, I can see my smooth letters. So iterations two. I can see there's some problems still with my type so let me to do a one but don't go underneath one and now there we go my nicely rounded letters so there's how quadify mesh works which allows it allows you to subdivide your mesh to add in an extra level of smoothing like turbo smooth or hello once you've actually modeled something, sometimes you can find that the smoothing isn't very nice. And we can actually obviously mo modify the smoothing in uh, editable polys, but we've also got tools that can help these things all together. So mesh editing, smooth is one of them. This is smoothing. This is not mesh smoothing, but how the light passes from face to face. At the moment it's at zero, so you can make smoothing groups or numbered faces but not, we're not going to do that now we're going to do Norto smooth for the whole thing at the moment it's 30 degrees and we can see that some bits of it aren't actually smoothed out why because the angle of the normals uh, between normals is more than 30 degrees so there you go this bit of there and that bit there it's more than 30 degrees and it's the same here for the the cheek going towards the nose that angle too big same for the chin and this bit of uh, bottom lip. If I up my tolerance in my threshold, this is the angle that I choose for having my smoothing under. So if I move it up, I can see that I'm smoothing out the various different bits of the head. But be careful, don't go too high, otherwise you might end up with artifacts that are due to the smoothing of the normals. Uh, but like this, we will delete this threshold and we can stop some of these black patches that we see on some models. Okay. Now we can go back here to choose Turbo Smooth to see if everything is nicely smoothed out. Uh, 
Okay, yeah, I think that with all these tools, there are lots of different ways of actually getting correct modeling and f for knowing how lights and smoothing work and knowing what's going on behind the scenes will help your modeling. 3D is very complex and now you'll understand that uh, modeling needs lots of different things and you've got to avoid for some applications like printing because you can get 3D printers where your object can actually uh, be output as a system of wax or polymers or even a kind of metal lathing. So this type of uh, file is called stereolithography. And that's why I have a modifier in mesh editing called STL check. STL check basically allows you to see the errors in your modeling. Uh, we can have a look open edge, double face, spike, multiple edge and everything. If I check I can see that there are 60 errors. Uh, it's open faces that cause the problem. Double face don't cause any problems. N multiple edge, no. Open edge, yep, there you go, 60. The problem is that STL files require closed forms. And it was great to tell me this, but now I had to actually find them and close them. That's for STL files. Uh, that was when I wanted to export in stereolithography. It was there. Okay, that's to be compatible with 3D printers. But now we see that Max has a lot more export options. Uh, before you could only have four or five different exports, but now we've got loads. We've got OBJ, we've got uh, AutoCAD, other things like XSI, and so on and so forth. Okay, OBJ is for Mudbox or ZBrush, and so on. Okay, so we've got our SDL check modifier. Uh, but all it does is it tells us there are problems for sending our files to a 3D printer. In our next chapter, we're going to see something a lot more powerful, which is new to 3D Studio Max 2010. That is a far more comprehensive checkup of your geometry to be able to say yes or no, well modeled. Okay, so what's this amazing new feature then? X view. Okay, so you go into the view menu and you can see it there. Or if you click on here, you can see XView X again, exactly the same. How does it work? See through, so we can see through it to our object, auto update, which is, auto update is fantastic because then it will show you the errors as you do. Display on top, displays over the top of the uh, display. Let's start with something simple then. For example, T vertices. T vertices, what are they then? When I select my object, then you can see T vertices. Okay, but what are they? T vertices are pretty easy. So when you've got a face here, a polygon, so you can have a face that continues off to the side, and a T vertex is a point that's here where there's no continuity in one polygon and one on the other. Okay, this is why this is a T vertex, because it looks a little bit like a letter T admittedly on its side here. Okay, right, once we've got them, now we can click down here and we can select results or we can change our configuration. So if we do select results, it's very useful compared to STL check. Here it selects the points automatically and because I take the option select results. So now it allows us to select the results there and we can go and correct our, our problems. Okay, so there we go. I can actually see all my T vertices. So, like we said, so here we've got a, a point here and there's no connection. And there's the same, there's the same, and so on and so forth. So this might create problems uh, with different programs and especially modeling for animation. There are lots of different options. So we've got faces orientation, so that's the ones that flip the wrong way. Overlapping faces are uh, polygons that are one over the other. Open edges, we can see that, there's segments that are open, borders. Uh, multiple edges, it's again, it's overlapping edges. Isolated vertices is for points that are completely apart from your object, but 
and uh, in your top level, but uh, aren't connected to anything. Overlapping is for vertices that are over the top of each other. T vertices, we've just seen those. And then you've got missing UVW coordinates, uh, which is a problem with the coordinates there. And when we go to the texture and UVW DVD, then we'll look at that. And flipped UVW faces, same again, it's where there's an error in the coordinates for the UVW. And overlapped uh, is more than one UVW coordinate on a single surface. And obviously you can select results. So this system is really useful, especially when you first start modeling. This allows you to see your problems, open edges, and you can have multiple things selected. So we can see open edges immediately in our viewport there. And like this, there's no problem to select them afterwards. It's something that I advise new modelers to have, very useful in 3D Studio Max 2010. Okay, we'll carry on with our little extras here. And you can see that if we get a file open, oh, you can see here, let's start again, open, you can see that I've got, a, we've only got 10 usually here, and here I've got 11. And in fact, I could have more if I wanted to. So how do we do this? Look, I keep putting these hints and dips in. All you need to do is listen in class, that's all. Okay, here we go, hint again. I'll tell you. Files, recent files in file menu, I've got 20 there. That's all. And now I can just go and find my head again. That one. Okay. Okay, so we can show you a little bit what's going on. So let's see the wireframe. Uh, let's turn off my subdivision. And I'll use a modifier, mesh editing. And we've seen STLs check, we've seen symmetry, and let's uh, tessellate. Tessellate. It's for uh, adding polygons, further tessellation. So this is based on edges uh, with the tension. Um, so it's going to try and make a curve with its tessellation. We can change face to center or we can make a division by face. Edge, face, edge. Uh, with different iterations possible. Sometimes we get nice subdivisions, but I wouldn't bother using it if I were you. Uh, so there we go for automatic subdivision. That's about it, really. Tessellate is going to really add more polygons to your model rather than subdividing. It might be useful for specific things, but in our case, I really think we're not going to use it very much, if at all. Okay, I'll show you because we're in the Bible for modeling and there are lots of little things in 3D Studio Max. Okay, so we've nearly finished with all the modifiers we see in mesh editing. And I'll just go over Vertex Paint for the moment and we'll come to Vertex Weld. We'll come back to Vertex Paint. Vertex Weld allows you to weld points together. So let's take this shape, make a mirror, copy. And uh, on purpose, let's separate them a bit more. Okay. So, the modifier Veltex Weld will allow you to weld points. So, as you might imagine. But for this, both objects need to be in the same object space, in the same top level. So, let's go back in the down into the poly, attach, and then there we go both in the same top level. Okay, so let's come back to Vertex Weld and let's change the tolerance. And there we go. Uh, okay, so the problem here, as you can see, is that it does it on all the geometry when, because all the geometry is selected. I'd rather it only did it on a particular surface that's very well determined. So if I take border, Control A, choose Vertex World, up the threshold, and now it'll only work on the borders. Okay, so it's always the same principle. It depends on the selection in the stack for the modifier. Vertex World allows you to automatically weld points. In Symmetry, why didn't I just use Symmetry? It's got a function for welding. 
It's good exercise for your fingers. You don't want everything to be automatic. And of course, the big reason is that if you want to use it with objects, well, we don't want symmetry. There you go, the truth is out. Vertex paint. Watch out, vertex paint is a bit special. We're going to mesh editing, vertex paint. Okay, for this, your object needs to be properly subdivided. It allows you to paint directly on your geometry. However, you won't see anything in the render because the vertex paint for the moment is not doing anything except colouring your vertices. In any event, if you change it to mapping, you still won't see anything. It's a bit of a disappointment. Well, for this, what you need to do is create a material and put it on the object and choose in which bit that you want to have the vertex paint. For a closer look, go and see the lighting materials and textures DVD. Just to have a look, so we're not frustrated on this DVD, I will advise you to click here on Diffuse and choose Vertex Color. Make sure the map channel matches on the material editor. One, two, three, there we go. Now we can see our heavy eyebrow. If we would changed it to number one, uh, we wouldn't see anything. Uh, if I put number one there, it would work. But generally, you'd be better to put a number above 2, so that's why it chooses 3 by default. For the subtleties of map channel, uh, sorry, I invite you to go and see advanced texturing chapters. Okay, right, this allows you to paint with a colour, to modify different colours, etc. We're going away from modelling, uh, so we can still paint the blur, the transition between the two. Okay. And like this we can see a pretty result. We could actually choose different colors for the whole object, like so. Let me choose a better color. Uh, there we go. So let's assign it. Okay, now we could paint different tones on here with a lower opacity. There we go, just to give a, a lighter colour to certain places on, on the skull. So the changing of the size of the brush is always the same, so control and shift. And there we go. Let's change to a lighter colour. Let's paint different areas of the object easily as you can see with l lots of subtlety because still we're in 3D Studio Max still we're using geometry okay if I want to let's change the opacity and make my brush smaller to give me more precision. Oops. That's control Z and that works really well. There we go. A bit of a blur on there. Okay, so and now we start to understand how vertex paint works. Okay. Right. When we render, then we can see it it looks roughly like what I did. Okay, we could put a little bit of more detail in there, but I think you've understood. Uh, let's paint here. Make the brush bigger. Okay. Let's rub that out a bit. Uh, control Z. So when you paint like this, it's a, a single colour, so it's not very obvious, obviously. You can add layers uh, you, as long as you keep the same match channel number. 
from there you can carry on with vertex paint it's a lot more interesting to paint by layer in, like in Photoshop and you've got different overlay modes here so let me put a little bit of red and let me blur this red out a bit and now I'll change the opacity at this point and there you go I can change the blending mode. I've even got a bit of a histogram. I can change the color. Right. So, as you can see, there are lots of little things that are really useful in Max. And it shows up at render time, of course. Okay, the goal here of our training is more oriented towards modeling. In the next what, bits, you'll see more with Vertex Paint to do with modeling, but I don't want you to be frustrated by Vertex Paint. It's a very interesting technique, but we're going to look at it a lot more in the parts of the training devoted to lighting material and textures. Here I'm going to use Vertex Paint as a modeling tool. Okay, Max isn't trying to compete with programs that are made for this thing, like Mudbox, but just for the odd thing, it's pretty handy. And like paper, why not? It's going to be more impressive for our example to use my character head. So to start off with this, let's go into mesh editing and choose vertex paint. And I'm going to just fill my character with black. If you click here, it will be completely black. And if you click there, you're just on standard max thing. You're disabling the vertex colors. That's to show the colors. That's to show all the colors. So completely black it's a bit odd sometimes but I'll leave it there okay now I'll change the color to white and now paint in a particular spot there we go if you want to see the wires of course you can press F4 uh, let me leave it in wireframe hitting F3 and showing where I've painted and to show the richness of the mesh. Okay, so here's where I painted. Let me reduce the size of my brush. And now I'm going to paint somewhere else up here, let's say. Okay, and here. Okay. Right, now I'm going to go into modifiers, selection, and volume select. I'm going to choose uh, Vertex, and uh, we can see all the vertices here. And here I want to select my vertices by vertex color. For the moment, there's no variation in the color. Where it's black, all the vertices will not be selected. Where it's white, they will be selected. Okay, yeah, but it won't work until you choose the type of mapping. Now, and so the type of mapping we've used is vertex color. Okay. So now let's use the modifier parametric deformer push. And we could put whatever we like, obviously. And so now it's working on all the surface, the whole object. So I'll come back to vertex paint. I'll check that I'm on vertex color. Yep. Okay, volume select. I'll tick texture map and now we can see that my push is working just on the areas that I painted in white okay if I come back to vertex paint I can now continue to paint in white and automatically the push will work on these bits Okay, All right, and now it functions exactly in the same way. If I make everything black or gray, everything, now the whole thing is going to be gray. And now I'll make a new layer, vertex color again. I'll paint now in white. 
and different zones of my shape. And as we can see, nothing is happening. Why? It's normal? Because we've got to make sure that the modifier stack is in the correct order. Vertex paint needs to be recognized by volume select, so it needs to be underneath. And there we go. No problem. Let me continue to paint a bit. What's interesting here to see is that I could reduce the influence, the opacity of that vertex paint layer to change the amount of push involved, which allows me to completely animate it. I could add on other modifiers, delete mesh, for instance, uh, above everything else, obviously. And now the paint is deleting the mesh in, in certain places. The goal here is actually to show that you can use different modifiers as you like. Okay, so this is how to use Vertex Paint to add some detail to your modeling. Obviously, it's more interesting on objects that are more basic, like a piece of paper, or to rapidly dent a saucepan or whatever. It's one of the uses of Vertex Paint. It wasn't really made for this. Uh, for a good use of Vertex Paint, then I'll invite you to go and study the Lighting Materials, Textures and UV Mapping Bible. More with splines. Perhaps it's about time to show you you can do more with lines than just lathe them. Okay, so when you make a text and you want to, say for instance, change the points, the first reflex you have is convert to spline. And then you can s select the points and modify them as you like. But if you do that, uh, now you've got a problem. You can't actually change the text. Ah. So let's control Z just to the text. Okay. Now I'll add a modifier, patch spline editing, edit spline. Now I could change the type of text, the font, and I can edit the spline, the points that make up my spline, uh, make up my text. Does it allow me to personalize certain elements of it? And there we go. Now I can add a an extrude modifier on there, and we can see that I've personalized my my text, my typeface. The other advantage of putting editable spline on there is that now you could take the line here and add additional modifiers to it, so like parametric deformer, noise. So noise on a line, well yeah of course. Here I'll just put some noise on Z and on Y and now change the size a bit and animate the noise. Now I can animate noise just on that one letter because I added that letter to my stack. Okay let me go back to edit spline Let's go back on animation, auto key, take, take the spline and changing its scale, move it around a bit. Uh, oops, certain elements of edit spline aren't animatable. Let's check, let's go to point mode, move them around a bit, and no. They're not. Edit splines aren't animatable. 
So, what do I want to do now? Okay, what am I going to do? Okay. For the noise. Oh, I've lost that now. Uh, there's the noise. Uh, let me check, change the uh, scale a bit and take off that. Look, I did a bit too many control Zing. Let's modify that. Okay, so there we go. Now it's the noise. Okay, right now, how do I do if I want to animate? So we know the solution. So here's an interesting cocktail. Right, over the top of the noise. Uh, but another modifier, an edit spline, as long as I'm not in 3D mode. So in this stack, this object is recognized as a 3D object, and on a 3D object, you can't add edit spline. So let's just cut that for the moment. So we're back to 2D, and now we can put edit spline. Okay, now let's paste and put my 3D back in my extrude. But why have we added an edit spline in there? So that we can select the spline that, that I'm interested in. Uh, so that one perhaps. And because the spline can't be animated, that's not a problem. Now I just add a new modifier in, parametric deformer, xformer. And now it's a separate object and it's the gizmo of the X-Form modifier that I animate, and that can be animated. Watch out. The center is probably going to be placed in the center of all of the geometry. So let's move the center where the gizmo is, where I want the gizmo. So it's like a second pivot point. Gizmo, auto key, and scale. Move it around a bit. And now, no problem, this is animatable. Like this, you can animate uh, top levels inside other top levels inside other top levels for your geometry. Okay, all these concepts are really interesting. Uh, we can see the importance of the stack and above all, understanding the order of our stack. I make a text. I add it, edit spline on top, I add it to a noise. Edit spline subs element cannot be animated. Okay, so it doesn't matter. We add another edit spline, which allows me to pick certain elements. And on that, I put an X form, and then I animate the gizmo. The advantage of this technique is if I found out that the C wasn't to be animated, but instead the WWWs, then I could apply the X form to those letters. And it's them that's animated. Or if I wanted to add it the uh, .com, I come back to the edit spline, select them as well, and now we come back to X form, and there you go, they're all animated. Let me take the www again. Let's come back to extrude and hit play. And there you go. Like that, we can quickly work with elements. It might happen that you need to bring in a line from another program. Sometimes this line could be made up of extra points than you need. A redundancy of points is, is always bad, but you can optimize the line. Or perhaps you just drank too much coffee and you just added too many points. Like this. Okay. Now, there is a modifier that will allow you to optimize the line. So we're just going to work in top view because we can see better in there. So Alt-W to do that and we'll take off the grid. So this modifier, patch spline editing, normalize spline. Now you can normalize the number of points in your line normalize or even add the trouble is that we can't see the points oh well, we forgot already object properties vertex ticks now you can see the spline and all the points and you can see the optimization a little bit better because you can see it if you reduce it too much you'll probably add too many segments but allows you to enrich or perhaps optimize your line normalize spline reduces the number of points or allows you to optimize the control points on your line. 
So should you always go through editable spline to change your points? It depends on your on the type of modifier. So here's our text in a pretty simple font, lots of straight lines. If I add the modifier patch spline editing, fillet chamfer, we'll find the fillet chamfer that we've got for lines. But here I can actually edit exactly the points I want, so all the top ones, and use a, a fillet. and these ones at the bottom and do a chamfer okay and just as a reminder fillet is going to take the one point that is there and spread it out but add extra edges in there extra segments to round it off chamfer will take the one point and spread it out we're in a straight line. So here's the fillet chamfer modifier that you can add to any line without having to need to go through edit poly or editable spline. Now it's down to you to make your own shape. And there you go. Okay, so let's try out the trim modifier. Okay, so with the line, I was just going to draw in this front view and just draw out. There's, there's no message here, I promise. Okay. Right, I'd like to cut these two little bits here. Okay, modifier, patch spline, and there trim extend so pick locations click and click and that is cut and now it's much neater and that's it trim extend allows you to cut the areas that you don't want trim extend also works for loops here we go let's take this trim itself and there uh, now let's convert this into spline and I'll check to see how it's worked. Has it cut the two forms? And yes. So it's great because it's clean, but you need to make sure that you weld your vertices so that they're welded as a single object. That allows you to be clean, but welding is not automatic. And there you go, it's cleaner and it's a lot more practical especially when working or you're receiving lines from other applications. So what is extend only useful for? Okay, so let's go in the front view here and let's go full screen and take off this grid and I'll create a line. Here we go. And stop there. Okay, to remind you, I've made my line like this and I stopped in this sense here. So extend is going to extend my line belonging to the same object. Uh, I can't actually explain any more simply. So here's the example. Modifiers, patch spline, trim extend, extend only, pick, click, and there you go. The line continues until it hits the other part of the line. Okay, now I can trim on this bit that's hanging off the edge. And that's it. Rendering lines. Okay, as you know, Every line that you make, there we go, or even a circle, have their own rendering rollout, all of them. And we can do enable in viewport and we can change the thickness. And same for that one. Let's change the size, the thickness. And this one as well. Okay, we're in the viewport and there we go. We've got lots of lines. Uh, we want to make a, a neon tube, it's going to become really laborious. So rather than doing this, let's just reset. In terms of production, this is what I do. Right, let's do the lines that interest me. Let's me do a text. I don't really care about rendering. So let's just type some text. www. I think you know what I'm going to type. cgitrainer.com, you know. So there's my text. And ooh, let's add some stars. So there's a star there. I'll copy it over here. 
Okay, and but underneath I'll do a line. And there we go. Uh, well, that'll do. Okay. Obviously, you've seen that every time I had to go on to rendering and all the rest of it, all I'll do now is press Control A, pull it, patch spine editing, renderable spline. Now they're all in the same render menu. So now I can change the thickness for all of them, change the number of sides. Like they're all independent, but I do them for all of them at the same time. It's a lot faster, it's a lot more practical than doing them one by one by one by one by one. And of course, nothing stops you from going in and editing the points as you like. So that's what renderable spline is for, which seems redundant at first look, but allows you to distribute settings to several segments or lines. Delete spline. We could ask ourselves what it's useful for, like delete mesh, it's not obvious at first glance. So let's have a closer look. If, for example, I make a spring, there we go, and I want the same radius on top and on bottom, so let's do 50, 50, and change the height to 2 meters, and turns, well, let's try 8. Hey, that worked. Right, now we're going to look at my line get rid of the grid and change my rendering options so enabling renderer, enabling viewport let's give it a thickness some sides yeah okay let's close that and let's go in modify and helix there it is okay uh, if I need to modify it I can change the height there it's not a renderable spline so I need to edit spline Tame the points and there they are and now I'm going to add the modifier delete spline. Uh, if you do this kind of thing, it's going to delete the points. Of course, but the segments are still there. So to have a little interesting thing, let's take segments and then I use delete spline. And I can delete certain segments at various places. What we also amuse ourselves with is using a tool like we know already, uh, a spray brush. So let's put myself in selection mode. And now I'll just use that tool. And there we go. Uh, I can't really see what I'm doing because Helix is in rendering. So let's turn that off in the view. And then now I can see that the points I've selected are in red so if I hit delete spine it works so let me render so I can see it and there we go okay automatically all the lines are capped they're all closed and if I go back to helix I can obviously change the number of turns uh, of course I respect some things so I can change the sizes and like that, I've got delete spline at different places in my helix. So there you go, the principle of delete spline. More with splines, and I save the best for last. I'm going to make a line. There we go. Very simply. I'm just going to stay in perspective view. I'm going to make it big, get rid of the grid, modifiers, patch spline, and here I've got ooh, sweep. Sweep allows me to choose different forms that I can extrude. So quarter round, T, so that I can model profiles for architecture or rooms. So here we've got just profiles that are lots, lots of different types. So wide flange and I'll have a look. Okay, we've got alignment. How does the alignment work? Align to pivot. Well, that's standard. Put yourself in the center of the pivot. Now we can choose the pivot like that. Left, right, in the middle, and so on. And like that is... Uh, so we can put the profile in the center of the line, use the line to put it at the top left corner, and so on. Align pivot, we can turn it off, and it will automatically align. 
so there's nothing more simple than this. The profile is this square. My line is here in the scene, and I've chosen the line at this place, and so it puts it there. So there's a grid divided by in nine different areas, so it allows me an alignment there, or in, in the bottom, or in the center, of course. Alright, if I take in that, I do a line to pivot. There we go. And we've also got the possibility of turning my extrusion and also to move it on X and Y. So, for you to look at other parameters, so length and width and thickness and so on, uh, and even the rounding corner radius. It's a bit of a, a an automatic loft. It's very practical for machined pieces, very rapid. I can even, if I want to, go make a star and make my own profile. So let me make a star here. There we go. I'll come back to my sweep. Use custom section. Pick choose my star. And there you go. The star is going to work with all the other parameters. What is good is the fact that I could actually make a, a rectangle for instance here. Move it around. Come back to the sweep. Pick. And there you go. I've chosen the rectangle instead. If I choose extract, it comes back to the line and then take it from the list. Pick the star. And there you go. Easy peasy. Uh, obviously, I can do instance, reference, copy. I could even just move it. Obviously, if you're an instance, then it, as soon as you change one object, it changes the other. Okay, this is the principle that allows you to change your profiles or to use the built-in ones. This makes it very simple for making beautiful skirting boards for your objects. In the next chapter, we're going to have a, a little exercise that allows you to use this kind of thing to make a skirting board for a wall or to give a little bit of extra detail to a geometry. And now a little exercise to get you used to using this tool with Home Sweep Home. Yeah, I'm not scared of anything, me. Okay, let me take a 2D form. It's extended spline channel. There we go. All right. All right, there we go, a C. Uh, let me turn off the grid and maximize. And let's zoom into everything. So let's extrude this and just a little bit. OK. And now I could convert it to poly or I could put an AD poly modifier. I'm just going to convert it. Take this face and then I'll go into inset. I'm just going to look at see where inset pleases me. Yeah, okay. So hit OK. And now I'll just do an extrude again. Lift up my wall. Alright. Now I'll go into vertex mode, it's edge mode. Uh, click there. And then choose a loop. It will choose me all those segments around the bottom of the wall. Okay, create shape from section. There we go, linear. Okay. Let's quit my sub-object. So turn off wireframes and show H, select shape. So I can see my shape now, which is around, and it's just segments. So platform editing, sweep. And let's look at the different types of form. I'll put half round, I think. There we go. Let me have a look close up. I'll have a look at its size and it corresponds to the size and there you go. Like that you can just distribute a load of profiles to wherever you like. It goes really fast as long as you know the tools in Max. This is why I insist on fundamentals in Max and now for basics of modeling. Like this you can train yourself to make a load of objects and you're starting to understand Max really well and I hope you're appreciating my teaching. 
Let's do a little exercise now to go over and revise what we've done already. This is one that I often do in lots of different uh, training centers or online courses or whatever. Let's make a cyclorama, which is going to be something that I put in the background. Let me bow up the left view. I'll just make a line with shift. There we go. Now I'm going to select the corner point and I'm going to give it a fillet. There we go. Now I'll go back to spline mode and I'll use outline to give my line a bit of thickness. Now let's go and mesh editing and extrude. Let me go to perspective view and increase my extrusion. Okay. Now let me move my pivot point with transform toolbox and I'll change the pivot point to Z and minimum and then center to object Z. Okay, very good. Object I'm going to center on the grid as well. Okay, there's my cyclorama. What is this for? Well, it's to put it as a background so that we can do a wreck ground and have a nice bounce of light. This is great because Materials and lights are what I'm going to look at in the next course. Well, let me continue. Okay, now I've got this. I'm just going to go and make a color. This is what I do. Add color, custom color. There we go. A bit lighter. Add color. Uh, untick assign random so that I know that all the objects that I've got are going to have the same color, this neutral color that, that isn't going to pollute my view. Okay, let me go back to the left view and let me make another profile. I'll turn off the grid and make another profile which is going to be a glass or maybe a, a porcelain cup. There we go, I'll go really quickly. In production that's what we're going to need to do. And we know quite a few different tools now. Okay, now I just like to isolate my work. Whoa, isolate! Isolate selection. Okay, here we go. There's my line that's completely isolated now. So let's go back to the spline. I'll give an outline. Whoop. There we go. Now let's get rid of this vertex, which doesn't interest me, and that one too. Okay, so this segment I will get rid of because I'm going to use a lathe and I will do a weld core. Okay, let me move that one a little bit over there. I'll take this one, I'll do a fillet. There we go. And those two, and convert them to smooth. Take these two, make another fillet. Just round that off. Okay. Th these two, I think I'll put them on Bezier instead, and so I can correct them a bit better. Okay, there we go. Alright. Oh, this one. Fill it as well, why not? Just a little one. There we go. So we've got a nice rounded edge here. Okay. Let's add lathe and we'll choose minimum. Um, flip normals, I guess. P on the keyboard to switch to perspective. Yep, flip normals is what we needed. Weld core and further subdivision. Okay. Uh, let me change the color. There we go. Now I can see a couple of problems here on the line, so let me choose the two vertices here and I'll change it to smooth just to make that line nice and smooth. There we go. That's how you can change the form of your cup and it's all pretty clean. Exit isolation mode. Now I've got my object on its cyclorama. For me, I save my objects one by one separately. That's what I did to prepare the scene. So if I now go File, Open. Oh, there we go. It's already there anyway. There's my cyclorama. It's all it's on its own. No surprise there. Let me take off the grid. Z to zoom in. Be careful. Perspective view, let me configure it so that field of view is 20. I'll cut down on the distortion on the perspective. We haven't seen cameras yet, but we're going to look at this later in the materials and lighting section. 
Okay, here's my perspective view. Let me reduce 3D Studio Max so that I can just drag and drop my merge objects. There we go, the ones that are already made. So there's a series of, of cups, merge, and then I'm going to put there. There's a box, which is beautiful, that I'll put here. A bottle, and I'll put that there. And that's it, let me make it big again. Alt-W to maximize the viewport. I'll stop displaying subdivision, and I'll now put my objects where I want them to make a composition. Stop! Before doing a composition, perhaps you ought to know the end result. Maybe it's a detail for you, but it, for me it means a lot. So, render. When we do a render, you can see here that this is the size of your render. To set render size, click here. So there you go, for more information, don't worry, I'm making you a special part of the course just about rendering. Okay, here's the size of the render, 640 by 480. Let me change it to uh, video, which is trying to disappear. So PAL video, 720 by 576, trying to disappear. Now we've got HD. Now I'll do a render, and we've got a render format for video. So now if I click on perspective and then I'll show safe frames. There you go. Now we can see the format of our render. It's a lot easier now to make a composition that's going to correspond to your render format. Okay. Let me put my objects better uh, on two axes only. So that I've got a composition that's a little bit more Correct. Let's just check that the objects are well placed. Big problem here, I can't actually reach the axes that I want. So what do I need to do? So move it and hit F8 until you're moving on two axes and you're putting the constraints on. There you go, rotate. It's the, exactly the same. If you don't get it, then just use the F keys. Move and there we go. And now the composition is a is a bit more interesting. Okay. Right now, all my objects are in the right place. So, and now, so they read better. What I do personally is let's just move that a bit here. Is just simply just just change the colors a little bit, just in grays. So here I'll take these cups and I'll just change them to a slightly darker gray. Gray. Okay, uh, take the bottle and just slightly darker again. Add color. Okay, and the box I'll just make really dark. There we go. Nothing but changing the grease here, and that way uh, it will allow you to get a more correct composition. And so now we can see a lot better the depth or whatever. So let's place lights. Okay, this kind of scene doesn't take very long to model, obviously, but it does allow you to to make you work. So let's have a little surprise here. Let's have a camera. To make a camera that corresponds to the perspective view, all you need to do is press Control C. Now you can see we're in camera view, and if you go to Alt W to show the other viewports, and look here to the view for camera view, and there's my camera in the left viewport. And you can see that my r l camera has kept the same parameters that I'd set for my perspective window. So generally, when you actually get close to the objects like this, choose 85 millimeters or 135 um, so when I was on 20 it was exactly between the two this is exactly the types of lens uses for portraits 
don't use ca uh, 45, which is generally the 50 millimeter lens that's used for everyday use. So put it at 85, and now you can move your camera around very easily, either on selecting its viewpoint or its source, but don't click on its line in the middle, and move it around as you like in the scene. It allows you to change your framing, very simply. Uh, manipulations are also here, so you can easily move your camera. If you're a bit worried about losing your camera, hit the space bar to lock your camera. Now you can click wherever you like, and it's always your camera that's going to move. So it's a lot easier to actually move it around as you like in the composition. Same for rotation. So if you want to look at different objects in your scene, if you change scale, you are going to be zooming in and zooming out, but you're not actually going to be changing anything with the lens, which is good because the distortions could be horrible. Okay, so there we go. Little hints and tips on composition, very quick, uh, that will allow you to work. Here's my image and its composition. Now to light the scene and to add one or two little effects. Good luck. Anyway, I hope you've learn lots of little things. Okay, you deserve it. I'll show you some of the work of some of my other victims. Okay, here it's a little bit of a clarinet. A clarinet, that's great, because it was invented by an elf sax, a Belgium, who also made the saxophone, just to give you a little bit more culture. Okay, clarinet, the oboe, etc. If you look, it's just a cylinder with lots of subdivision. Maybe the student put too many subdivides in there, but the rest is renderable lines with some forms that are easily made with soft selections and pulling out. Soft selections and this kind of thing, they're all very easy to use and give you lots of detail. But when we look overall, hey, that's pretty good. Now we see its form completely. You might be frightened, but with everything you've seen, you could make this. Okay, what I promise you is that with once you get to grips with lights and materials then you'll get this because they can do it. This is an image made by one of my poor victims. Starting with something like this, with this exercise, we can rapidly make this kind of thing. If I look at this I can see that obviously you need lighting, you need materials, you need textures. Oh, well, okay, okay, right, fine. In terms of modelling, all it is is just a plane and some extrusions. Go on, do it. Change the composition, learn how to change the colours. It's not difficult. Don't jump straight into trying to animate characters or anything like that. Learn how to use your camera use textures, light, place them. There you go. It's a typical exercise that we could make after, what, about two weeks in my school? Two weeks, that's about 14 days of, of learning, and you could probably make this kind of thing. We'll continue like this with our navigation in the first exercise with just a clarinet, and we'll go a bit further now this should remind you of things, so look at all these shapes. There's nothing complicated here. We're going to look at lights and materials in next training, but above all it's composition and light. And we're going to show you all this. There's no mental ray in here or other things. It's just a render from Max, just a baseline render. That's all it is. Here are some. These are just simple exercises, pragmatic, and that give you the most beautiful results. Uh, you could say that you could make lots of time for the head and for the bust, which are the two most complicated exercises. If you can't do them, just get rid of them. Just think about making compositions. All the other objects, we've all seen them. All these objects that you can see here, we've made, we've seen. Look at these in terms of wireframes. Don't worry. I'll show you how to do these things afterwards. Okay, good luck. Make friends with a bat so you can spend the night working in 3D Studio Max.